Okay, welcome everybody. Um, to week 16, we're almost what down to the last uh, 10 or 15% of the new slides. And then of course, the final is the 18th week. Um, and that will be three weeks from tonight. <clears throat> Two uh, weeks and tonight we'll review for the final. And I've said it before, but just as a quick, again, uh, heads up. It's the same exact length, same number of slides, same format, and same grading, uh, you know, procedure as the midterm was, and it's not cumulative, of course. So uh, that way, when I cut the list of slides down by 30 to 40 percent, at least a third from the study list that you have now in your syllabus, uh, then you'll you'll know that only eight of those slides, the remaining slides, will appear on the final. And it's worth 100 points, of course. Now, let me go ahead and go to the speaker view because I have just a couple of quick uh, things to, to cover and then something more uh, for, for individuals here. Let's get this. Who I've noticed, I was just looking at this right before, right after I set up this meeting and before I, uh, <clears throat> you know, did set up the, the slides for this lecture, which are waiting to be seen, and we'll get to them in just a few minutes. Well, by the way, we're going to take a slightly earlier break and then do a somewhat shorter second half. I thought about turning all the way through, but the problem with that is there's so much, you know, to say about Gothic architecture. It's our last new unit. And yeah, I can guarantee there'll be at least one slide, if not two, of Gothic uh, churches on the um, final because they're so important. Okay, is anybody else? Is just, okay, good. Uh, so here's here's my first little end. This is quite, it's house cleaning, I call it. I could try to do this individually, but if I did it for every somebody's always happened about every other week, it seems like somebody's microphone is either on or picking up some extraneous noise. Hopefully that will end. All right. I'm I'm this is not in any way any kind of comment on any one individual or group of people, but it, for your sake, those of uh, and it's, it's several people, so it's not like one person that I'm singling out. There's about a half a dozen people for whom, and of course, if they were going to drop by now, they would have because the deadline was uh, what was it, November fifteenth or something. So um, <clears throat> you know, obviously, the grade you get, whether you forget to turn in or don't get around turning something in or not, is what your total points are, regardless of you know, whether all the assignments were turned in if you hadn't dropped before the deadline, meaning this would hurt some people's GPA if they didn't, you know, uh, follow up. So I'm just giving a heads up. These are people for whom I got the midterm, which tells me they're serious. Obviously they want and did well on the midterm, not saying how well, but well enough to, you know, indicate they should get a good grade in the class. But I'd never either didn't get a first or second paper. Uh, or, so that's what I'm doing. I'm going to take, it won't take long, there's six, so uh, Carlos Castillo, I don't know if you're out there, or you'll hear this on YouTube. I didn't get either first or second paper. You still have time in any of the people I mentioned this, but you know, obviously at this point it's it's 10 points off for being late, and yet you can make that up easily with extra credit. So moving down the list here, most of them are in the second half of the alphabet <laughs> for some reason. Uh, uh, Kayla, uh, Kelaya, Canopa, again, turned in, actually, yeah, right. Uh, did a midterm and I didn't get either either a first or second paper yet from that. Okay, and then we'll get down to J Jessica Rosales again, a midterm, but I haven't yet seen a first or second paper. There are sometimes cases where they don't get through to me. And that's also why I'm doing this because if that's the case with any of you, you have a record of when you send it and you need to resend that. If you did the first paper and yeah, I think by now you would have said something to me or email me, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so just, just a heads up, uh, Elijah Schwartz, I think I got something from you uh, today. So that might be taking care of the two papers, right? There's two that were due for that. And that's it. I just believe in being proactive, um, you know, because it's getting toward the end of the semester. And don't forget, there are deadlines, a deadline for any late work, first or second paper, midterm, isn't either you did it or you didn't. And, and that doesn't apply to hardly anybody in this class. Everybody was there for that. So that's over and done with. But either one or both the papers, that deadline is the end of the week before finals. 
which in essence means the Friday before finals. I'll send you an email to remind you. So that's what, a little over two weeks from now, but don't wait till that week to do it. Because if you back yourself into a corner like that, I've never seen it fail that students who try to cram one or even two papers, late papers into the last week or so before the final end up not doing so well in the total grade because you don't give yourself enough time, obviously, for both tasks, not to mention your other classes. And then the other, sorry, go ahead, please. I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, if you didn't call her name, does that mean that you did get our paper? Because I was on vacation yeah. and I was using like a, a hotel computer. I was not What's sure. your name? Uh, yeah. Michael Windrick. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. I can double check that. Usually I do that if someone asks me in the body of the email, or the, you know, the, te the top lines of the email, please confirm. I don't automatically do it because 95% or maybe 98% of the time they go through, but yeah, there are exceptions. Okay, let's see. So you sent your, you're talking about your second paper, right? Uh, yeah, I, uh, the second paper, I think you already emailed me about the first paper saying you got that in the midterm. Uh, it was just that second paper we turned in uh, on Monday, just trying to make sure. Yeah, well, let me do that now because what I'm doing is checking for the- No worries, sorry to hold up class on that. Yeah, well, this, this is a, a good thing to do now because we're still going to end early. I, I expect a half hour early, but this is important after all. Okay, hang on. Um, let's see. Because it's faster for me to go ahead and, you know, some of them are still out with, uh, with readers, and by which I mean um, the readers are the people who, let's see, you know, my, oh yeah, yes, 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 I just sent those, you know, the readers were busy this weekend. One, mostly either out of town or one of them's father was just being uh, released from uh, the IC unit because he got COVID, even though he was fully vaccinated and he's, you know, a vet and everything. So I gave her a little bit of extra time. So actually, your paper was received. Thank you. And it's just going to take a little longer than a week, probably 10 days for me to get it back. So I probably will be able to give you afford it to you, of course, by email. So you have the grade confidentially. But yeah, I got it. Anybody else have that kind of question? Now's a good time to ask. I just, I have another question. So sure. are you going to cut down the list for the final uh, next week or the week after that? Week after, two weeks and tonight is our review. Okay. Gothic, final the next week. She, because next week we cover other than our, uh, churches. Gothic applies to that whole period, not just to the, uh, you know, of the late Middle Ages, not just architecture, though the odds are more likely if, that you will see a gothic church at least one on the uh either slide id or the essay part right the slide analysis part of the final but there are also paintings uh not too many people started painting already it wasn't just in the renaissance <laughs> where suddenly one day people woke up january 1st 1400 CE or AD is it up oh, I think we're gonna start the renaissance let's go out and get some paints and canvas yeah it kind of was a segue from you know icons we've covered icons right in the painting so we're gonna we're gonna see a few of those next week as well as this might surprise some of you authentic medieval church and medieval house one each in the United States they're the real thing they're not revivals of Victorian style uh, buildings. Oh, good. We got, here we go. Let me let her in. Hi, Ying. Yeah, we are we didn't get to the slide yet, so you haven't missed anything. I was just, just giving people a chance to ask questions. Any questions you might have about, uh, you know, grades. I already, I won't repeat the deadlines, you know, they're coming up, but I think you're, you're in good shape. So, all right, anybody whose name I mentioned would be, uh, uh, if, unless they're just, you know, drop the class in, in practice, but not officially. Nothing I can do about that because it's past the deadline. I have to submit grades uh, for everyone who's still on my roster. Okay, so if you heard your name or you do when it's on YouTube, uh, check in with me and you don't have to give me a heads up, but just are you, if you're going to send the paper, then do so as soon as you get a chance, hopefully in the next several days. And if it's two papers, hopefully one or two people that might have that situation. You can do one one week and one the next, but it's best not to wait to rag before the final. It's 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 very uh, unlikely that, that that all your work would get a good grade then.
Okay, any other questions? Oh, no, the other real quick topic is a fun one about extra credit. I can tell you right now that extra credit options by, in fact, I'm just looking at the same, you know, grade roster and very few people have done more than, in fact, 10 points as far as maybe somebody sent me some, some things uh, later on today. I was checking my email up until around five. Uh, I hadn't seen any others. Uh, so almost everybody has anywhere from, you know, I think one person has 15 points. What is that? 45 more you, that person could get or 50 more for the several who have 10 points by going to a museum, by watching a movie about the life of an artist and writing two pages of what you learned about that artist and their work, uh, or by going to an architecture site and taking photos of the exterior. Uh, since I don't expect you to go to interiors, unless you can, if it's convenient. Oh, I got a tip. In um, Petaluma, there is a Petaluma adobe, and I think it was called Casa Grande, even though it, you know, isn't very, very large, but it's bigger than most adobes. And it's, uh, I know it's there, but I've never seen it. Well, I've driven by it, I guess. And it's open to the public now uh, as a state historic landmark, assuming that stays the case. Uh, then, then you you would be able to go there if you you know obviously it's not well if you live in Santa Rosa was it 18 miles each way or thereabouts um, that's an option um, that's part of our our history and is definitely historic architecture and it doesn't have to be from any period or style that we cover any architectural site obviously the exceptions would be Costco warehouses and fast food outlets those are mass produced, but something that was individually created is a church, a house, uh, a historic building, uh, a town hall or whatever, you know, some, some kind of uh, building with some interest. It doesn't have to be old necessarily, but usually the more interesting buildings have some history behind them. And that's worth 10 points. Four photos in color sent to me as a PDF, identify the site, the building and your name and the class. Okay, and then there's the four articles that's, I, I, people ask me this in my, my afternoon class. So the, I like to keep it to no more than 20 points in each category. So you, you vary a little bit how you get your extra credit and get more varieties of exposure to, uh, you know, different uh, venues, right? Different outlets to see uh, art and especially the museums and architecture ones are meant to get people out into the real world and seeing where art is outside of a, a website an online course a textbook, what have you, in the real world. Um, okay, and so I was, I was been told by two students this afternoon in that class that they really enjoyed, it only was about an hour, but it's a special exhibit at the Legion of Honor called uh, Pastels. It starts with uh, Renaissance, so it covers the periods we haven't, but next semester I may, I hope, I'll see a few of you. I'm teaching art uh, 1.2 and we, we, we start with the Renaissance and go all the way up to early 20th century. Uh, and so that's that's a really interesting course and uh, some of my slides that I've taken again from these places, not as many, but m some of them will be shown that, you know, just for your own enjoyment. And of course, that period is very rife. I mean, what's well, a period? It's several periods. Our uh, Renaissance was a couple hundred years and now we have Baroque and then we had, uh, you know, er early uh, Romantic and all the way through. So we cover all that in Art 1.2, as some of you may know if you took that course from someone else. Um, but anyway, that, that exhibit, it's called Pastels at the Legion of Honor, closest museum to Santa Rosa. Uh, parking's free. I try to park as close to the museum as you can. That's my only hesitation. We know the parking in San Francisco, the city streets for sure, is not very safe these days for reasons I think you all know. But that, there they're patrolling. I've noticed that. I went over the summer with a friend of mine, uh, actually a former reader of mine, and she, she had, wanted to see the Pe Pompeii exhibit. And so we got, we just had to circle twice and we got to park right in front of the steps that lead into the museum. And all those cars around us in our, my car was no problem. You know, and they do, I noticed they were patrolling fairly regularly. So it's, it should be fine. Any other museum in San Francisco, there's parking garages on or like the Asian Art Museum, right across the street is the entrance to a secure city run parking garage. And, uh, and then also the De Young has a garage underneath. So anyway, keep that in mind. The museums are, are open, at least as far as we know. I don't know. We will find out if this new variant is anything more to worry about. But uh, at some point, life has to go on and you have to take the normal precautions and then proceed. 
Okay, any other questions about anything extra? Oh, of course, you, you remember there are my two novels. They're worth 15 points each. If you just show me proof you downloaded either one, they're both art related and you could just check the reviews. In fact, you can read the first chapters in any Kindle book on our on Amazon Kindle. You know this, it, it says look inside and then you can see for yourself, is that interesting to me or not? That doesn't get you 15 points extra credit, but if you download either one of those, it, it would. And there are the open house murders all over San Francisco, architectural historic sites that are real places that you could go for other extra credit to, to take photos of, um, described in detail. And then also the other one is uh, <clears throat> South Side Story about growing up in Chicago in the early 60s. Okay, I think I've covered everything I was planning to, but are there any questions before we launch into our first slide for tonight? About one more clarification. Someone asked when you were gonna be cutting down the slides. Um, I think you said two weeks from tonight, but I thought our final was two weeks from tonight. So I just wanted to make no, sure I have that. No, our final is uh, this this year we go to the third. It week does say week. it on the syllabus that it's uh, next week that we're going to be cutting down. Hmm. Our final is well, on the 15th, right? Hmm. Now, this is interesting. This has happened before. Uh, I'm looking, we're going to go, yeah, let's see, December 16th, 6th and 8th. Yeah, and oh yeah, I see what you're thinking. Yeah, December 13th is the final. So, yep, you're right. We will be done in time because I built in some flex time. I always do that toward the end of semester because sometimes they take a course, the daytime courses, we don't know when the finals are until they decide at the beginning of each or early on in each semester, which, which well, that was when it was in person, you know, which class is which time slot. So that isn't an issue here, of course, since it's all online. Okay, so let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. Um, we are looking at, well, no, no, I just want to double check because I was looking at my syllabus earlier tonight, but let's clarify. It's absolutely a very important thing. Okay. I have for week 17, December 6th and 8th, um, yes, you're right. What that means is, Yes, we're going to finish Gothic architecture. I mean, Gothic art, non-architectural slides. Well, actually, a couple more slides. Uh, uh, but we will also cut down you know, later. We'll do that the second half of the class. Yeah. So we are now looking at... But next week, 100%. Well, that's why I'm double checking because oh. somehow there's a week that's missing there. And I know this is from, I didn't make up this, you know, calendar. It's called the academic calendar. Okay. So we're looking at this week. We're obviously now December, uh, November 29th. Yeah, we're supposed to have uh, finals exam the week of the 13th. So let's clarify that. That's the most important thing. Yeah, the final exam is definitely going to be in this class on Monday the 13th. This is not Friday the 13th. That's a given. And we're not supposed, you know, some colleges, they have a, a bye week, right? You know what I'm talking about? Dead week, they used to call it. I don't know if they still have that term. At UC Berkeley all the time they did that. The week before the exams, you're supposed to just stay in your dorm or your home, whatever, your room and cram. Uh, we don't have that tradition here. And we're told we have to teach that week. I remember trying to give my students that option. And I was told, you can't do that over a doctor pay. So, so I'll be here and we will cut down the list. Um, and we will do that on the 6th. Yep, that's right. We'll do it on the sixth. So that leaves us. You're right. Okay, let's restate. It's actually right here. Why don't I hold it up to the screen? Because some somebody in this class, I think it was, I think it was uh, Rob. I don't see if he's here tonight. Um, had pointed out that there was one version of this that somehow must have been when it was merged. My wife did that to create the PDF files for perm, you know, so I can keep them in my you know file PDF file list. And forward them to people because people lose things all the time it happens you know and i always try to accommodate people that way so here's what is in the syllabus the official correct here we are week 16 tonight and then next week we finish gothic on december 6th and the 10 and do 
reduction of this study list. Yes, you're right. So that will be the second half. Don't leave during the break. In other words, we will need the full night for that. We probably won't in early because I don't want to cut off anything. You can ask any question you have about the test other than what's on it. Okay, sorry, thank you for, for clarifying that. Was that, I don't know who said that, but yeah, they were uh, being very helpful. So two weeks from tonight <laughs> is the uh, final, literally the 13th of December. And of course that starts at 6.45. Now all of that is, and I'll send you an email to remind you, I always do, uh, starts at 6.45. So even if you tend to sign in late, try not to sign or log in later than 6.40. So you'll be here when the first slide hits the screen. And you will have, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but, but I'll just say you'll have the same amount of time until midnight that night to, if you want to in any way, you know, modify the file before you send it to me um, or convert it to a different, to a PDF, right? Which it needs to be for me to be able to open it. Uh, you'll have till midnight which gives you what, several hours after the class is over. Yeah, so there we go. We will do as much of the Gothic architecture as we can without running right up till we'll end still a little early tonight. And then next week we'll finish the first half. The remaining slides, I may even cut one or two then before we do the review, which will be the second half. So it's one week from tonight, the, the second half of class is the review for the final. Two weeks from tonight is the final exam. And when you're done, I'm just going to sign off and you can keep working if you want. But that's it. We don't have any more work to do that night. So, yeah, two weeks from tonight, we'll be uh, done. Thank you for helping out for all our sakes. I forget who it was that brought that up. Okay. Are we ready to start tonight's uh, topic? Actually, not quite because you need to see. This is really important. I, I worked really hard on this. Believe it or not, I had to do it four or five times. I'm going to hold this up to the screen as best I can and get my fingers out of the way. These are the five main features and you are gonna be responsible for knowing them if, and I'm saying the odds are almost 100% that at least one Gothic church will be on the final. And because of that fact, these are the features you might have to identify if it's on the slide essay part. Five main features, and we're going to see them all, so I'm not going to describe them. You'll see them on the slide in just a minute. The tall tapering spire, I think everybody can read these. Pointed arch windows, rose window, flying buttresses. That always gets people going, huh? What does that mean? And gothic groin vaulting. Okay, you, this should allow for a screenshot if anybody wants to take one. There we go, try to get it all in. It's hard to do that. There we go. Yeah, back up. All right, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to focus on for the whole lecture tonight. Here we go. The screen share should still be working. There it is. Our first slide. Okay, this is one I'm not cutting from the study list. I've always done it that way, right? When we get to one that's really important and you want to make extra careful notes and study extra carefully, I give you a heads up. So that's what this is. Okay. All right, this is... Um, <clears throat> Church, it used to be a cathedral, but it's now a church. It's been decommissioned and made into just a neighborhood church. I've been here. It's, it's really an interesting place. Church of Saint or Saint, well, the French would say Saint, so let's, just, let's just say it our way, Saint Denis. Now, that's the French pronunciation of the first name, Denis. Church of Saint Denis, D-E-N-I-S, ambulatory. Now that word is part of the meaning. And if you didn't write it, you wouldn't get credit for identifying. But you, as you know, you have the syllabus in front of you during the exam. Ambulatory. Okay. And that's spelled A-M-B-U-L-A-T-O-R-Y. Again, Church of St. Dennis, we would say, but that's spelled D-E-N-1-N-I-S. Ambulatory. A-M-B-U-L-A-T-O-R-Y. France. 1145. Okay, so why are we looking at a few columns and the ceiling and some stained glass windows in one corner of a church that you've never heard of? Well, here's the first fact about the meaning. It couldn't be more important to understanding Gothic architecture because this was the first Gothic church ever built. Once again, I'll repeat that. This was the first Saint Denis Gothic church ever built. 
It's where the Gothic architectural style was created. And the bishop, because it was a cathedral at the time it was built, who designed it was, as I said, most bishops were trained as architects or at least had some skill in that field. He actually was trained uh, to design architecture. His name, so he's the father of Gothic architecture, is Bishop Suger. And that's S-U-G-E-R, almost like the word sugar, but pronounced Suger. Uh, so he's an important person in the history of architecture. You, you definitely would have to say one of the most important ones. He created this concept of these five features that I just showed you on the, you know, holding up that uh, diagram I, I drew. Uh, and so here you see um, only two of those features because we're looking at what is an ambulatory. Okay, welcome, let's, let's get, we're just starting with the first slide. Okay, so it's the first slide under week 16. Um, okay, so this is an ambulatory, the, the, the title tells us that. What does that mean? It's a curved walkway at the back end of a uh, church. It doesn't have to be Catholic or any particular denomination. So just say it's a curved walkway around the back end of a church. And uh, in this, being a Catholic church, of course, it's French, it's from the Middle Ages. Uh, this would have been a walkway around the behind, or you can say that wrapped around the rear of the altar. So you could walk around behind the altar. Why even have those? Because that's where priests would set up for their, I was gonna say performance, <laughs> their, their, their sermons, their um, you know presentations, however you wanna call that. They would have been able to walk around behind the altar to set things up for the service, their, their, their religious services and store things and stuff in the back. So that's what a walkway is. And here, if you look closely, you can see how it curves, you follow the cursor. And this is actually the very tip of the edge of the uh, base or foundation of the altar, which is obviously off to the right of the picture. Okay, so what are the two features here? We can see that mark this is Gothic out of the five. Pointed arches everywhere you look on this church. That's a, that's a window framing. It may look like a doorway, but again, if this was a wider angled lens, you could see you know, one of the stained glass windows, but these have the same pointed arches. All the doors and windows, not always. Most, just say most doors and windows in a Gothic church have pointed arches. You know, at the top, they curve up, upward to a point, of course. That's an idea you might remember was, was originated with the Muslims. We covered that with Islamic architecture. And here you see it in France. Well, there's no proof, but most historians believe that the idea, the shape of this arch in a way, was, was influenced by crusaders who came back from the Middle East, right? From, um, right, different parts of the Middle East, it doesn't matter where, from, you know, being in, in the Arabic uh, or Muslim, I should say, Muslim cities where pointed arches were everywhere. And so at some point, perhaps the idea filtered into France through uh, returning crusaders. That's one theory. Makes sense to me. But this bishop wasn't just using pointed arches for the doors and windows. He created a whole system of design. If I was in an in-person class, you'd get to see me do, I was going to say pantomime. That sounds terribly cliche. A um, acting out with my actual whole body along the wall of the classroom and I will do it for my in-person class if you care to see how the performance will begin at about 7 p.m. in uh, 708 Annalee um, on Wednesday. When I, I have to line my body up against the wall to show the difference between a, a Gothic and Romanesque churches. We covered Romanesque last week, you should re recall. Those had rounded arches and they had extra support on the ceiling from the vaulting. So this has a, a new kind of vaulting and here let's get a close-up of this that's pointed gothic, in other words, vaulting. If you look carefully, all of the vaults, these are the vaults, right, remember? They meet at the groin in the midpoint at, at the top of the ceiling, the highest point of the ceiling. And they reach points. They have pointed arches that over, uh, uh, sorry, intersect each other. And that's what gothic groin vaulting looks like. Now, when you put those two together, along with the other three features you're gonna see in the next slide, on the outside of Gothic churches. Here's the last 
fact to, to mention about this, that uh, when you put all five of the main features of Gothic architecture, the ones I drew in that diagram, that you do need to remember for the, um, you know, possibly on the true false section and at least one slide of the final. When they're all five are being used, that makes those buildings, those Gothic uh, churches or cathedrals, much stronger than any type of architecture ever invented before anywhere on, on earth. And that's what made it possible for two things, and those are the last two facts, on all the slides that had to do with Gothic churches, this is true that only by using those features, the pointed arch doors and windows, the Gothic groin vaulting, the flying buttresses, uh, and then the other two features are more decorative, the rose window and the tall tapering spire. But certainly you'll see what flying buttresses look like uh, from the outside in the next slide, next couple of slides. So when you put those together, those basic main features of Gothic churches, you, this was possible to have when you did that, and only with that style, only with Gothic churches. Walls of windows. Look at the, let's go up close here, the amount of glass in these walls. And look how minimal the stone is in between. Over two thirds of the wall surfaces of these churches at least in parts of the walls, not everywhere, but in the front and back, certainly they would have done that where the light, you know, is going to penetrate, are, are glass. And then only about a third are stone. There's no way that that minor amount or, you know, minimal amount of stonework around the windows could support the weight of anything. <laughs> so the pointed arch works with the Gothic growing vaulting, and you see more of it here in this, this view. And then the flying buttresses on the outside, I'll explain as we go along to the next couple of slides. All those things put together allow, here's the last fact to write about, allow for a second thing that only Gothic churches could do. Towers of over 500 feet. That's like a 50 story skyscraper today. Now this church's towers are only about 250. You have to, that's a new style. They were just experimenting with it. So they didn't want to build something that might collapse. By the way, yes, a few churches in every style over the centuries, in, not just in Europe, but other parts of the world have collapsed, particularly in the Middle Ages. But Gothic architecture was so strong that it is the only style that would have allowed for, or been strong enough, I should say, strong enough to support towers of up to 500 feet. Do you remember with the Romanesque, the maximum height was around 300 feet for that style. So this is an engineering revolution. That, that's the phrase I'd like to use. You don't have to use it on the exam, but it's a good way to summarize in just one phrase what was so unique about this style, so advanced. It really was an engineering revolution. Okay, let's do a formal analysis. This would be balanced if you were to stand right here where the photographer would, because you've got two sets of Gothic growing vaulting, of course, and equal width on either side of this aisle, right? of the column. So, so it, it may not look symmetrical, but it is uh, from left to right. But from top to bottom, that's up to you because the ceiling is massive, more massive than the floor, obviously because of the vaulting, right? There's much more stone and brickwork on the ceiling than there is on a flat stone floor. So in terms of masses, the ceiling is clearly the largest mass, then the floor, and then the, the uh, columns, or you could say the window framing and then the columns would be fourth. The rhythm is very strong and of course should be pretty pretty obvious, but I'll uh, elaborate. All the pointed arches that are used on the groin vaulting crate rhythm, the columns do. Of course, these columns do help support weight, but they're nowhere near strong enough to support a multi, you know, 100 foot tall tower. Uh, they, they do help support a bit, but they're just a, a, a backup to the other system of support we'll get to when we see the exteriors. Okay, and then we see the uh, windows and the pointed arches on the, the, the tops of each window, like this one. All of those have the same basic shape, lots of rhythm. And of course, it's dynamic on the pointed arches and the groin vaulting, or you could just say on the ceiling. Those are dynamic. The floor and the columns are stable. The colors are cool on the floor and the columns and warm on the ceiling. Um, now, the walls are also cool, but let's just see because it's hard to tell, but where the brick begins, now that's just uh, from the age, you know? So it's, again, I give you guys flexibility. When you're looking at this slide, if it's on the final, and you say in this photo, it appears that the walls are cool. 
I wouldn't, uh, you know, take points off or anything. But actually, having been the church, yes, it's great. They're they're great. Uh, similar colors to the columns, but the ceiling is clearly wall because it's brick, red brick, and red stone lining it, the, the vaulting. Okay, and then we have for space, it's one curved, or one you could say long curved aisle with about a 15 foot high ceiling. That's not very tall for a church. The towers are, are like 240 feet uh, above the front end of the church. So, so it, it gives you no idea of how massive the church is from the outside. But again, I'll repeat that this real space, which is a curved uh, aisle, you know, um, a long curved aisle with about a 15 foot high ceiling. And then we have texture. Well, it's, I'm going to say, yeah, there is, you could say there's similar texture on the carved leaf patterns at the top of the columns, but that's so minor that it's not basic to all Gothic churches. So you could just say most of the textures are the real rough texture of brick and the real smooth texture of uh, the marble. It is marble in the columns. Then real rough stone on the lower walls and real smooth glass in the windows. So again, two real smooth textures the marble columns, the glass windows, two real rough textures, the brick and the stone on the walls. Did you say that the uh, leaves on the capitals are simulated texture? Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you could. And that's done with carved line, but most of the line, because we can go up close, you can see that. But most of the line is visual, isn't it, around the arches and painted on the windows, because stained glass by definition is, is painted. I think you all know what that means. Stained glass means it's painted. It's not really stained like dipped in you know, vats of stained colored dye or something. It's a very meticulous process to you know make the stained glass windows. It, some of them took years to make. You're going to see some beautiful windows probably right after the break when we get to the one in Paris, Notre Dame, that had the fire right a couple of years ago. Okay, so um, once again we have painted line on the windows and carved line on the, the capitals or tops of the columns and visual line on the arches. Um, I forget, oh, balance, I already said symmetrical. I don't know. Oh, modeling, it's just the shadows from the sun. Um, and I think I mentioned stable dynamic. Yeah, did I miss anything? I don't think so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, here we see one of the first Gothic churches in, in the entire world but it is a really good photo to explain the features on the outside of a gothic church this is one i'm not cutting from the study list it's it's really an important slide chart cathedral facade and that's the french pronunciation for the city in france where it it, it, it was built chart is c-h-a-r-t-r-e-s cathedral facade or as my indiana relatives pronounce it facade f-a-c-a-d-e of course that means exterior in architecture Chart cathedral facade france 1260 well this was the second gothic church ever designed i'll say this and repeat it say it slowly because it's it could confuse a few people but it shouldn't if, if you just follow me and, and write it down directly it's the second gothic church ever designed but only the third Gothic church to be finished. Oh, now how could that be? Well, I already got that statement. Anybody need me to repeat it? Because the reason is, you're gonna see why in a few more slides, like two or three slides from now, the church in Paris, the famous one, Notre Dame, thank God it survived that fire. That was one of the saddest days I've ever, <laughs> thinking that piece of absolute incredible beauty. You'll see why I say it is one of the most beautiful buildings on earth. It's always rated that way. You'll see my own slides of it from all over different angles inside when we get to that. But anyway, for now, I'm just saying, well, how could that be? If this was begun after Saint Denis, uh, then why wasn't it finished before uh, the one in Paris? Because they were more in a hurry and they had more labor available. Paris was already a pretty big, decent sized city in the Middle Ages. Not like it is now, 10 million in the crater metro area, but you know, had a lot of skilled craftsmen and laborers, so they could afford to build that cathedral in Paris, Notre Dame, uh, more rapidly. And and usually these took 100 years. On average, Gothic cathedrals took about 100 years, some of them 150 and a few even longer. Rarely were they done in less than 75 years. And the one in Paris was under 100 years. So, so I'll say it again. 
This was the second oldest Gothic church ever designed, but it took longer to build than the one in Paris. So then it was finished as the third completed Gothic church in the world. And it's considered by many to be the most beautiful. I prefer the one in Paris for a lot of reasons, but it certainly, this is a, a very uh, interesting uh, structure. It's world famous. There are whole books, documentaries about this. People have written poems about it. It's been painted by all kinds of artists. It's in a town a, a good hour and some minutes away from Paris. It's not in the outskirts of Paris. It's, it's a bit of a, so, a drive. So no, just to clarify, so Notre Dame was the second one finished? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say that when I got to that slide, but thank you for clarifying. Is that Rob? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> Oh, by the way, if that is Rob, did you get, I responded to your question with your paper. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it was a, a really interesting topic you chose there. Okay, so what we have here is the second oldest church to be designed, and that's not a minor detail, because how did this bishop of this cathedral, Chart, know how to design a Gothic church? He consulted with Bishop Suger, the, for, the inventor of Gothic architecture. I don't know if it by letter, maybe he took a, you know, a carriage or, or a horseback ride to Paris. I, I'm not sure. By the way, Saint-Denis is in what's now a suburb of Paris. Not the safest area <laughs> in uh, metropolitan Paris. Uh, but in any case, it's, it's, it's not literally in the city limits, but it's, it's part of the greater Paris area. But this is nowhere near, you know, it's got a hundred miles away at least. So they somehow communicated, just say consulted is the right word. This bishop consulted with Bishop Suger to get ideas for designing the second oldest Gothic church, but it just took them a lot longer to finish. You know, they had a few problems, things like, don't write this, plagues, wars, witch hunts, <laughs> bringing out their dead. No, I'm sorry. I'm no, not being facetious. The last one, okay, no, that's not. Well, yeah, they did that after plagues. They pretty much had to, right? And that's not exactly <laughs> an overstatement. But the point is a lot of things could have prevented this uh, church from being completed in under 100 years. That, that apparently in Paris, they didn't have the same, quite as many problems anyway. All right, so now what are the features that mark this on the exterior as Gothic revival? Well, let's start with the tall, oh, sorry, you said revival, that's, that's later, as a Gothic style cathedral. The tall tapering spires should really stand out. Why are they different heights and widths? We'll get to that in a minute. There's a, there's a good reason as part of the meaning, but first just noticing those features, the tall tapering spires, and of course the pointed arch, let's get up close, windows, the rose window, most people consider that the most beautiful uh, feature of Gothic architecture. It, they, these are large round stained glass windows on the front and sometimes on the sides of Gothic churches. And then these are flying buttresses, which, hmm, I don't know if I should interrupt the lecture and do a, a body enactment of it, but I'll just explain it. Um, <clears throat> because, yeah, we want to keep moving here. The flying buttresses have an arm reaching out it's this is the buttress that's what supports the weight of that massive set of towers and they're on the other side too but of course this photographer was taking them from a slight angle to the right side you know slightly to the right of the front of the church and so there's space in other words with flying buttresses between the wall and the buttress itself but obviously in order to support that wall they have to be attached so it's like uh, arms of stone that's i don't know if that helps but maybe it will for some of you uh, to explain how that works. It's like someone standing next to, you know, a, a wall, whatever, made out of stone or brick, and they're trying to support it. So they stretch their arm out and put their hand flat against the wall they're supporting. I hope that helps give you some image. But even if you don't understand the mechanics, you don't need to, to get a good, you know, answer for this if it's on the exam. Again, I'm not cutting this slide. Just say it this way, that flying buttresses were a new invention created for Gothic architecture to allow the, the strength to support these massive towers. These towers here are nearly 300 and well over. The taller one is about 330 feet. So just say they're each one around 300 feet, one is slightly over and slightly under. Uh, and they get taller and taller as the, as the uh, late Middle Ages went on. As the Gothic era goes forward, there are more and more churches with taller and taller towers. These are massive, even at 300. Did, uh... Did Sugar or whatever, did he invent that as well? Flying buttress? 
Yeah. Oh, well, that's the whole point. I'm glad you asked that. I thought that, yeah, it's important to make that clear. He's the one that came up with combining all five of those features into one building. Super I don't have any engineering, really. Sorry, it's go amazing ahead. Amazing engineering. I'm always been fascinated yeah. with like structure. Oh, he was that. some, yeah, I think he was trained in engineering from the classical period, but the Romans, you know, they had, I told you about that, the texts and things from the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, when the monks kept learning alive by copying illuminate manuscripts. Somehow he read a lot of the early, they hadn't printed books yet, not this far back. So he had to have read some of those ancient texts about engineering. And then in his fertile mind, he said, oh, I see, if I add some new things like pointed arches that I, that my crusader members of my congregation who went to the Middle East had, had drawn for me or whatever. He would have had to see some image to get the idea. And then he came up with it. Yes, he, he's the one that came up with the idea of flying buttresses. I know I had a couple of students say, it sounds like a, uh, an act, a, a, a group of acrobats on the old uh, Ed Sullivan show or something, the flying buttresses, not that kind of flying. They just are detached from the wall up until the very top when in a section of, I call it an arm of stone. Uh, reaches out and there are rows of them. They go all the way around the sides and usually all the way around the, almost always around the back. In fact, they, they just about have to, of the church and around the other side. So on three sides, not the facade that would ruin the beauty of the of the design of the exterior or facade, but on, on you know, both sides and around the back, you see rows of these, uh, you know, flying buttresses, which means that they're uh, buttresses where just the top part connects to the wall like arms of stone. And that supports so much weight that when you add to it the pointed arches, which deflect the amount of stress, if you're an engineer, you might know that word. Of course, everyone in, who's a college student and or worked during the pandemic knows that word. But the other kind of stress, weight, the, the, the pull or force of gravity pulling down and out. Gravity is always pulling things on earth down and in a building outward makes the the stress it's called let's let's do a slide go down through the, the the spire into the base of the tower and then down through the walls and out into the flying buttresses in other words to finish up on that point the flying buttresses carry the bulk the majority of the weight of these buildings and that is why they can be so large so tall these towers can get much higher than they would have been uh, it could be, I mean, during the Rom Romanesque style, because the flying buttresses, that combined with the pointed arches, because the pointed arches distribute the weight down this way or the stress out towards the wall. And then, of course, the arches down here and the width of the walls themselves are also very thick. So below the flying buttresses, they're supported by the actual walls. But that wouldn't be very tall, would it? A building just it ends here. Now, if you're very observant, a couple of you, nobody said this, I'm surprised. The three arches in the middle where I just put my cursor right below the rose window, they aren't Gothic. Wait a minute, did he mess up? Did he, <laughs> I was gonna say screw up, uh, forget something or give the wrong blueprints or plans to the contractor? Uh, no, those are windows, part of the meaning now, left over from a Romanesque church that had stood on this same site and burned in an accidental fire. And so that gave this bishop I don't know his name, not this one, uh, the Bishop of Chartres, the opportunity to build a new church. And he'd heard somehow about this new style in Paris or near you know, Paris at Saint-Denis. And so he got in touch with that Bishop Suger and the rest is history. So yeah, there is an exception in that these three windows were just incorporated because sort of like what happened after 9-11, if you remember those rather sad photos we saw of the site a day or two later, there were sections of, and those were Gothic arches too, by the way, but those were just decorative. They weren't functional from the exterior of that building, of both buildings. I forget if it's just one that stood, oh, a good two or three stories above the ground uh, with nothing but sky behind them. If you remember, some of you, if you were alive, some of you during 9-11, or you've seen film of it. Yeah, so that's what happened here. Just the front wall of part of the front wall of an old Romanesque church was left standing. So this bishop said, well, let's just incorporate that, saves a little time, a little money, a little material. So he incorporated the designer of this cathedral, the bishop, the old Romanesque arches for just that section and everything else is pointed arch. And that's what helps distribute the weight. For instance, you notice he didn't, he wouldn't have done that if those were rounded arches here because the pointed arches carry more weight 
uh, than the round arches. Don't ask me to explain, that's an engineering fact and I'm not an engineer, but they do kind of keep the weight of the building pushing towards outward towards the, there they are flying buttresses. You can only see, I think, uh, the edge of two, one of them and the edge of another. Oh, you're going to see them on Notre Dame. It'll be very clear if they aren't yet. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole meaning, except I guess you can say one more fact, which you can't see from here, but you will in the next slide. I have an interior view, which is that this church is considered by many, and you just want to say it that way. It's not even historians at this point, just many people to have the most beautiful stained glass windows in the world. Uh, I don't know if I would agree with that, but I would say they're some of the most beautiful. To me, the most beautiful ones are in Paris at Notre Dame. But these are way up there. These stained glass windows are all original. This town didn't get damaged in World War II, which is probably why they're all still there. Uh, that isn't true for all of the French cathedrals. But this one, the original windows, 900-year-old windows are still there, and they are quite beautiful. Okay. Any questions about any of the meaning I just gave? All right, let's do a formal analysis and, and go on to the next slide. All right, so this has the rhythm of the pointed arches. Oh, I forgot to tell you the last part of the meaning. I'm sorry, before we do the formal. How, why are the two towers a different height and even a different width? Okay, can anybody guess which tower was added later? Because the two were built at a different time. In fact, in different centuries. When the church opened, this was all there was. You see where the, I'm going to say, it was just the base of the two towers and they hadn't yet completed them because the towers aren't essential, right, for people to worship inside the building. So just keeping it simple, you can say the two towers were built at different times. And if you want to know the one that, it's, I'm going to ask somebody can guess which one was later. One of them was finished, it well, actually was finished in 1260. Yeah, that's right. One of them, the oldest one. And I'm going to say the one on the left is the later finish. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good little uh, thing to keep in mind if, well, you'll have it in your notes because I'm going to tell you. The, the later a building or a section of a building is, the more ornate it usually is in style, it's about decorative detail. Yeah, the more ornate the tower, the later. Yeah, this wasn't finished until 1516. You don't have to know that year, but that is something you might want to put in your notes. So if you do the math, that's a, that is a good, uh, let's see, 200, let, if I can do the math there, how much later that is. Um, yeah, 250 years later. So you could just say more than two centuries later, the taller, narrower tower was completed, the one on the left. And it's a late Gothic, more ornate version of Gothic. The same style, the pointed arches, right? And the tapering spire, but it's much more ornate. And that's true of every period of human, it's even true of painting and other visual arts, but definitely in architecture, it's true. All you have to do is, is, is go around neighborhoods. You have them We're all over in Petaluma, Santa Rosa, or go to San Francisco or Alameda and see where there's Victorians from like the whole Victorian era from the earliest, from the gold rush period when the first Victorians were built all the way to 1900, the end of the Victorian era. And you'll see how much more innate they got the later they were. It just, I don't know, it's some human characteristic. So yep, this is the later tower, the one on the left in this picture, the taller, narrow one. Okay, formal analysis, is it balanced? Left to right, I'm about now first. Well, technically one tower is taller, obviously by about 30 feet, but this is wider. So I leave that entirely to you. Which side do you think if either outweighs the other or do they roughly balance each other because they are the same shape and within what, you know, 30 feet isn't even what, 10% of the difference in height. But if you feel the wider tower, which it probably is heavier, probably, it would be the, the stone on it would be thicker probably. Uh, then you could say it's unbalanced toward the right, which is what I tend to think of. And then the narrower tower is lighter in weight. We know that. So the largest mass is the older wider tower on the right. The second largest mass would be the uh, newer, uh, narrower tower on the left. And then it would be the facade. The towers, by the way, go to the ground. So the tower is this whole thing. It's not, people think, oh, it's just a part above the, you know, the walkway here, the parapet now, or above the ceiling or the roof. It's everything from the foundation to the top. So, so that's the largest mass, that tower. And then the one on the left, second, and then the facade, or middle, you can say the main wall, just say main wall or entryway. 
this section is you know all open and we're going to go inside and see what that looks like in just a, a moment okay the rhythm obvious the tapering spires oh almost all the windows have pointed arches the rose window has this beautiful decorative pattern and that's all stained glass and the flying buttresses they all create rhythm repeated shapes it's dynamic on the two tapering uh, spires uh, and on the pointed arches and the rose window and the doors also we're going to talk about why three doors when we get to Notre Dame. That's more detail that we didn't get into right now because we're going to keep moving. There's a meaning to that. Every Catholic cathedral I've ever seen has three doors, even ones that were built more recently. Um, and there's a symbolic meaning for that. If you're Catholic, you probably already know, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. So for now, you can just say that the, the, the dynamic features are, are dominant in all the decorative details and the two towers, the tall spires at least. But the walls, the overall shape of the facade below the spires is stable, of course. And uh, the flying buttresses are both. The arms of stone reach out and they curve toward the wall, but you can't tell it. You can just say the, flying, the buttresses are mostly stable primarily because of course a buttress should be pretty much straight upright. So from this view, they just look stable. Okay, the textures are the real rough texture of stone and real smooth texture of glass. The lines here, these are not carved, but you could say they kind of look like carved line. Actually, in a way they are, they're carved out of stone. So you can say there's some carved line around the doors, but if you have this view, I'll try to get it larger during the, well, I can't really because then you can't you know, see the whole thing, and I don't want to distract people. Let's see. Let me let me do one thing here. Let's see what we can do. No, it yeah, it's it 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 doesn't give you the full view. So this is the slide you'd have if it's on the exam. In any case, we can just say that there's you know a carved uh, line above the doors, and you could say on the rose window, uh, and on the um, uh, taller tower. All the other lines are visual around the windows, all the windows, and of course at the edges. And that's, uh, those are uh, lines, the visual lines are formed by the modeling. Of course, the natural shadows from the sun, which there isn't much at this time of day, uh, but there's no technique for modeling. Space, most important fact about architecture. Here we go. The nave is about 120 feet tall. There are much taller naves in, in Europe. Uh, a big open, remember the word nave? We covered it. You will need to know that for the uh, uh, final, because uh, both Romanesque and Gothic churches have naves. So that big central aisle. So you could just say one long central aisle or nave with about a 120 foot tall. Whoa, just had an earthquake. Pretty good one. My dog's going to bark like crazy. Yeah, that, that one almost not. Really? Well, yeah. How about you guys? No, I'm in North. I'm. West yeah, County, there, but yes, County, 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 County. yeah, yeah. Well, you'll hear about Maybe it. Maybe it's time. coming. Yeah, <laughs> let's hope not. Uh, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Just a little interruption. Okay, because this is kind of important to finish this up and move on here. So sorry, just startled me. All right, so what we have is a color is an actual light yellow. It may look off white. And if you wrote that, I wouldn't take points off because in this picture, it depends on your screen or your monitor. But it's actually light yellow. The real color of the sun. I've been there a couple times. Uh, and then it's uh, gray, uh, which is, of course, you could say either neutral or cool on the uh, spires. Okay. Uh, and I would say that it's, I already said it's weighted toward this, but did I say top to bottom? Unbalanced toward the bottom. Yeah, obviously. And let's see. Oh, the towers. I didn't finish that. I got interrupted by nature. Yeah. The, the space inside is 120 foot tall ceiling on the nave. And then this tower is a little under 300. You have to know exactly. And it's 280 something feet. And the other tower is, is a little over 300. So they're, they're about 25, 30 feet difference in their height. But they're both nearly 300 feet with the one on the left being slightly over. Okay, I think I've covered everything. Texture, modeling, color. Okay, this is the interior. So this is the next month's snow, and it's the nave, N-A-V-E, of Chartres Cathedral. And do you remember Chartres? C-H-A-R-T-R-E-S. France, again, the same location, same date, uh, 1260. Remember, this was, I, I don't have to repeat everything about Chartres, right? Because you just got that, so, you know, the second old, the second Gothic church ever designed. 
So this was the part of the church where the stained glass windows are considered by just again many many people to be the most beautiful in the world. They certainly have deep rich you could write this way they have some of the most rich and saturated colors uh, in in the windows. Uh, whoever the crafts they were probably were men at this point I'm almost certain they would have been so you could say craftsmen who um, who made the stained glass were probably the most skilled stained glass makers in the world at that time. And uh, you'd have to get there underneath and look up at them at, when the sun's shining through to see why. But you're going to see that effect with my own slides inside Notre Dame. Okay, and a couple, a few more slides. All right, so this is the round rose window. Here are the Romanesque arches I just described that are left over from a fire that destroyed the earlier Romanesque church, but all the other arches are pointed as in a true Gothic church. Here is your side aisle and here's your folding chairs. Remember I said they didn't put permanent pews in many. Some, some Gothic cathedrals had some, but most didn't have any seating except for the, the, the wealth and uh, high born, you know, the upper classes. But here they didn't even do that. So you brought your own seating or you stood or sat on the floor. So obviously those are new, but everything else is original to the building. And here's your Gothic groin vaulting. See how it works? One, two, three, four groins visible here. That supports the weight of those massive, help support the weight of those massive towers. So where do the flying buttresses come in? They attach right about here on the outside. And so they help support the weight of everything above them. And then these walls here are thicker on the bottom and the pointed arches still help support, remember some of the weight. And then there are these columns too. They, they, they add an extra backup support. They're called clustered. You don't have to know that, it's more detail. Gothic churches usually have groups of three, four, six, even columns clustered together in one you know, section. And so these are clustered, but you can just say columns uh, that help support uh, some of the weight, but most of it is carried by the flying buttresses and the Gothic groin vaulting. Yeah, this is an engineering marvel when you think about it. this far back, nearly a thousand years ago, they were able to come up with these ideas and these buildings haven't not only collapsed, but they're not um, even slightly damaged at all. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, that's pretty much the whole meaning here. Remember what a nave is, though. If it's on the exam, I'm not saying this is so important, I won't possibly cut it, we'll, but we'll deal with that next week. But on the other hand, uh, if it were to be on the exam, you would want to say that the nave or large or long, actually is a better word, long central aisle is where the worshipers sit. And this is what we're looking at, where the seating is now temporary, of course, modern folding chair. And these people would be facing the altar and whoever took the picture was standing right in front of the altar, right next to it, obviously. And then there's your rose window. Okay, formal analysis, balanced. Well, this picture may not look balanced, but obviously a nave by definition is symmetrical. However, the ceiling always in Gothic churches are much more massive than the floors below them, even though the floors are, you know, at least as wide. Uh, actually, they're wider because of the way they go out past the aisle, the columns here to the edge of the aisle. But there's so much stone and brickwork on the ceiling, I would say for, for mass, that'd be the largest mass, then the floor, and then the columns, you know, and then the, uh, the wall above the arches. Okay, and for textures, we have real rough texture of stone and real uh, smooth texture glass, that's it. The modeling in this case is the natural modeling from sunlight. You do see some you know, shadows here, but there's no technique for that. I mentioned what the space was, but I'll say it again. The central, I'm sorry, the ceiling on that in the nave is about 120 feet uh, tall at the peak here. And then the side aisles are just, much, you have to know, any it's a, are much uh, lower ceilings, two lower side aisles and one central aisle with about 120 foot high ceiling. That's the space of this section of the church. The rhythm is obvious. I think I've covered that right with the pointed arches or maybe having the columns, the stained glass windows, lots of rhythm. Um, and then we have, uh, let's see, line here is mostly visual and what's well, painted on the stained glass and visual around the you know, rose window. Uh, well, actually it was carved. We agreed with it because there is some kind of stonework done on the rose windows, the shape of them. So there's a little bit, but you can't really see much of it. So you can just say that mostly it's visual line around the groin vaults 
and uh, the arches and then painted lines on the stained glass windows. And then the color here is ironically inside more of the cool gray color that we're used to seeing except on the ceiling where it has that you know yellowstone look so the ceiling is warm and the uh, arches and columns and the outer walls in the interior are a kind of cool gray color okay how are we doing on time yes do yeah, this is a really important slide. This one is high on the list of probabilities for the um, final. Some of you may already recognize it. Hang on, let me just make sure I don't run out of <laughs> my voice doesn't give out. Nothing like cold coffee. <clears throat> okay, here we go. This is a really important slide. Notre Dame Cathedral. Uh, and that's in, in, of course, there's a famous football school in, uh, in Indiana where my mother's family is from. Um, and they say Notre Dame, but the French would say Notre Dame. N-O-T-R-E, the, the two words are French, D-A-M-E, Cathedral, Notre Dame Cathedral. Location, of course, Paris, and the date is 1250. So I'll start with the fact that I guess it was Rob was clarifying when I was mentioning with the last slide or the, the, the second slide about the timing of these churches. This was the third Gothic church ever designed and the second to be finished in the world. And that's why I was mentioning that with uh, Sharp because they started that church sooner but they couldn't finish it as soon as this. This church only took about, I know you're gonna laugh at this, um, 87, and just say less than 90 years. In the Middle Ages, that's like warp speed. <laughs> well, for construction of a building this large. I mean, the restoration from that fire, uh, they were saying five years. I, no way, I knew that, having been here and talked to people who are architects that live in Paris and admiring this structure. It's one of those places where you just, you know, you don't forget um, when you see it, it's, it's, it's on the UN UNESCO, right? The world heritage list. Of course it is. It would, it would be shocking if it wasn't has one of the first buildings ever listed. And it's, you could write this part of the meeting. It is consistently rated as one of the 10 most beautiful buildings in the world. Some historians and I almost of this mind, but yeah, probably the Taj Mahal if I ever get there, but just looking at the pictures, I might think of that as, but this is in the, I think it's in the top five worldwide and that's not just you know a few historians or um, architects think that way that's that list of you know world cultures that's kept by the UN and then they do polling and as well as other organizations the Pew Research and you know you don't have to write any of this just say that any international poll taken of people's most favorite or popular sites around the world that are considered the most beautiful buildings in the world this is always in the top 10 and often the top five of that list and we're talking about hundreds of sites that are on the unesco world heritage list okay why well first because it's symmetrical it's balanced visually and most people prefer something balanced now we know frank gary doesn't from looking at his buildings <laughs> uh but that's a more recent trend uh, but this was typical of French Gothic architecture. Somebody asked me that last week, I think it was. Yeah, or maybe it was in my in-person class, I can't remember. That in France, both Romanesque and Gothic churches tended to have uh, symmetrical, you know, or you could say almost identical towers. Now, why am I not just saying identical? So in other words, Chartres an exception, that last cathedral. This is early on, you know, by the time this guy was designing this church, he had the other two plans and blueprints that he could look at, right? So from this point on, it set the, the this church set the, um, let's say, the um, tradition, there we go, in France, established, if you want to say that, but, you know, I mean, it wasn't formal, but it set this concept or this tradition for having twin towers or tall towers. Now, if you don't know this, there is a tall tapering spire, but it's not in the front of this building. Otherwise you might say, where's that fifth feature, right? Or the first one on my little chart I, I held up to the screen. 
it's because it was chosen by the bishops to or bishop who designed it to be behind these two towers on the top of the pointed ceiling and it collapsed during that fire you may know that so they they were going to put some ugly modern piece of garbage up there it's like why would you do that so finally enough protest you know got through to the the people who are supervising the re restoration of this church that they're replacing the one that really is there you're going to see that in my next few slides and those will be ones you don't have to take notes on but this one you do so let's recap Okay, so this was the sec uh, third oldest Gothic church ever designed, but the second to be finished. And it set the, you know, style, you could say, or the tradition in France of having uh, twin towers on their Gothic churches, not just cathedrals. But there's something misleading about that, just slightly. There's something different about these two towers. Can anybody look carefully? at the two of them and can you spot something slightly different between the tower the upper part of the towers on the left or right the flat top the which flat top oh well no that's that's part of the design i meant something about the i'll give you a clue the proportions uh of well, i'm pretty much giving it away but maybe not <laughs> there's something different between these two towers they're the same shape the same height and they flank each other at exactly the same distance, you know, uh, uh, you know yeah, I mean, equal distance right. from each other. But there's something different about one of the two towers and the other, from the other one. It's very subtle, but if you look closely, I mentioned proportions. So since I said they're the same height, think of the other direction. And are, so, the, are the arches slightly different? Yes, and yet that's only part of it. Yeah, that's in the ballpark. Yeah, so which one do you think is how how would they one be? on the left is more ornate so i'm guessing that one was finished oh later. <laughs> no i'm still okay good guess but actually in this case that's not quite what i was aiming at i'll give you one more clue i'm talking about proportions of this the two towers the upper part i'm talking about just this section of these two towers nobody notices something different between the two it isn't obvious, but once you you know, it's like, why didn't I notice that before? Is one slightly wider? Yes, excellent. Give the man an A plus. Okay, <laughs> yes, this one is two feet wider. So the so the arches are slightly wider, but the entire dimensions or width is a better word. Sorry, width of the tower on the left is two feet wider. It's it's a it's an optical game. I call it a game, or you know tactic that the bishop created huh. just to have a little fun and be different That's interesting but guess what he didn't stop there something different about now it should be obvious about between these three arches it should be obvious what's different about one of them the doorway arches the one on the far left has a strange yes like, an extra angle. point yes above right. it yeah yeah an extra added a uh, narrow point above it uh, I don't know why he did that. It was just, again, this bishop was per perhaps he, you know, felt it would be fun to watch people look at this and not guess. Of course, he wouldn't have lived long enough to see it completed, but he designed it with blueprints and everything. Yes, they had blueprints back then. They weren't blue. <laughs> I, you know, they didn't have photocopies, but this would have been, uh, <clears throat> you know, written and drawn in detail every, every part of the building by the original architect who was the bishop so yeah he was playing around you could say that we're playing optical tricks on observers both in making the tower on the left two feet wider and adding an extra point above the doorway on the far left okay now the three doors that's part of the meaning is a very important part of the meaning here three doors in a catholic church whether it's a especially a cathedral but i think any catholic church we'll just say larger catholic churches cathedral or otherwise always had three entrances anybody who's out there is catholic might want to explain why that's true and if not I'll i'm just going to guess for the father son the holy ghost yeah exactly right <laughs> you got it i'll say it again it's because that use of three entrances or three doorways on a catholic church symbolizes the holiest three holiest figures to the catholic uh, church which would be not the pope <laughs> god supposedly quote the father his son jesus and a holy the holy ghost they call it which isn't the one most people who have never been to a catholic service don't understand but it's supposed to be a spirit that god sends back and forth from heaven down to earth to communicate with people so again the holy ghost is the phrase they use. so god they symbolize god jesus and the holy ghost the three holiest figures 
uh, to the Catholic Church. And so that's why the three doors, there, there are always going to be three doorways. Now you see the Gothic pointed arches. Remember what makes a building, whatever style it is, is always part of the meaning. So this should be an easy one if it's on the exam. Uh, all the, here are all the windows, uh, right, and doors have pointed arches all the way to the top of the towers. And then we have this rose window, which may look smaller than the one at Chart, but it's actually bigger. And the two biggest rose windows on earth are in the sides, and I'll show them to you in the next few slides. I may do that after the break. Let's see how late this goes. Let me finish with the formal. Oh, it's only 748. Okay, well, the biggest rose windows in the world are on the sides, in the transepts. Remember, I said that could be useful, but you can just say wings if you prefer. Uh, on either end of those two wings or transepts are much larger rose windows. This isn't a small one actually, but it's only about 30 feet across. The others are 40 feet across and they're just breathtaking. Okay, so then we have, um, of course, the only other features here are, the, oh, I didn't say this, the kings and queens here, who some historians believe have a dual meaning, and I do, because just knowing French history and having friends who teach history in France or have lived there um, for many years. There, there is, so just say, uh, many historians, again, that's a safe way to say, believe that the, uh, the row of figures above the doors have dual meanings or dual identities. The first is as uh, early kings and queens of the Old Testament uh, or holy, you could say prophets from the Holy Testament. Uh, and I would be like um, King David, you know, of Israel, right? And uh, maybe even Herod, right? Cause he was the one, you know, <laughs> tried to get rid of Jesus when he was a baby. And then his son <clears throat> was ruling when Jesus was arrested. So there'd be two King Herod. So anyway, some of the earlier rulers and prophets, you can say it that way, from the Old Testament, only the Old Testament the Bible. That's the obvious meaning of these. But look, they're all dressed in, in uh, medieval style robes and crowns and things. So the other, some historians believe, or many, that the other meaning is to symbolize the earlier kings and queens of France. Because then you kind of are associating, right? the ruling class with holy figures from the Bible, which is another way of saying that, you know, they can do no wrong. They can do whatever they want and you can't question them. In other words, giving them, quote, the divine right of kings and queens to do whatever they choose. And so that makes sense to me that it's both a religious and political symbolism in those figures. But we know for sure the, the stated intent, the Catholic Church itself says, well, these are just figures from the Bible, from the Old Testament early uh, prophets and uh, rulers from the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament is called. Okay, and then the, uh, there's much else to add to the meaning, uh, except that the flying buttresses aren't visible here because I took this picture as a close-up to use in this class on a very gray overcast day in December. Um, <clears throat> okay, they're cleaning it. If you're curious, yes, that scaffolding is because they're cleaning. You know, hey, the city with 10 million people and cars everywhere, uh, of course, some of the streets, aren't, cars aren't allowed, but most streets in Paris, they are, and trucks and all that, you know, you're going to have pollution. Uh, so they, that's why the colors are different. So let's do the formal elements. Is it balanced? Yes, roughly, I would say, because technically it's weighted, though. Okay, you could say it's silhouette. It has silhouette or outline. Those are the phrases that uh, an architect would use. It's, it's outline balance, right? The shape of it or the silhouette of it is pretty much the same left to right, as well as uh, obviously unbalanced, of course, toward the bottom as it's wider below the towers. But uh, when it comes to left to right and balance, technically speaking, now you guys all know this, so you probably should just answer it this way if it's on the final, that it is in fact, though it appears to be balanced, symmetrical left to right, it actually is slightly unbalanced toward the left because of the extra width of that tower. The largest mass would be that tower then. Remember, it goes all the way to the foundation, even below the edge of my picture. And then the second largest would be the slightly narrow tower on the right, and then the central section of the facade or the you know middle portion of the walls. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the peated pointed arches, the rose window, the statues of the kings and queens, the Gothic, it's called tracery. You don't have to know that word, but it's kind of a convenient word if you want to write a tracery, just like it sounds with an E-R-Y, is, is, is that's what this is on the, the rose windows always have that. 
and then here. But those all create rhythm. And of course, there is both stable and dynamic detail as there is on any you know of these churches now. Um, same thing with, with Romanesque, right? Any uh, pointed arches everywhere on the doors all the way to the top of the towers, those are clearly dynamic, of course, as is the rose window. Uh, but here, the basic shape of the church, overall, the outline shape or silhouette of it is, is stable. The, the edges or corners of the, of the walls and the two towers are very much, the shape of them is stable. They don't taper here, but there is a tapering spire. You'll see it in one of the next few slides I'm going to show you. All right, the color is actually a uh, cool off-white. The real color is this, not where my cursor is but this, and there's no warmth to that, but there is warm color in the stained glass. Plenty, you'll see a lot of that as we see the interior. And then we have um, line here is both carved, definitely on the sculpture and, and uh, above the doors, there's carved line on these uh, deeply inset or recessed pointed arches. That's, that's all carved line and at least to some degree, I guess it's somewhat carved. Yeah, it would be on the edges of the rose window. But most of the lines are just the visual lines at the corners and edges and around the windows, the outer win edges of the windows. And those are, of course, whenever there is sun, there wasn't that day. The uh, modeling, natural shadows in the sun is the only modeling, no technique. For space, the two towers are really important, are about 240 feet each. And then the nave is about 140 feet, the ceiling inside of the nave. It's about it's one of the taller, but not in anywhere near the tallest nave in Europe. It's taller than most naves, about 140 feet. You'll see that. It's pretty impressive. And the two towers are roughly 100, uh, 240 feet. Okay, and then let's see. Are we forgetting anything? Um, balance, rhythm, mass, stable. I think I covered everything. Um, well, I tell you what. I'm going to go ahead because it's not quite eight. Because then we can, uh, the second half, we'll, we'll be able to finish up in like 40 minutes or so. But I, I do need to take a break in just a minute. Okay, here we go. You don't have to take notes now. So let's just take a walk around and inside the church. And for those that are interested, uh, you can't do the second part now. If you go to Paris, you're not allowed inside because it's a construction site. But they're going to restore it sometime in the next decade. Uh, hopefully it'll be open for the end of uh, this decade. I think it will be. And they just barely saved it. If the fire had gone on another hour, I don't think it would have been possible. So that's, call it what you will, <laughs> divine intervention, good luck, minor miracle. <clears throat> it is one of the most beautiful structures in the world. So look at these flying buttresses. This is what I've been talking about. You see these walls of window. Here, it's even more pronounced than it was on the earlier Gothic churches uh, at uh, Chartres and Saint-Denis. The, the walls are reduced to about a quarter of the or stone and about three quarters of the width of these walls is glass. And that's made possible by these arms. That's why I like to call the arms, look like arms, don't they? Arms of stone, the flying buttresses, their upper section, which reach out towards the walls that they support. And here's your tall tapering spire. Now that wasn't finished until the mid 1800s. You don't have to write that. It's actually part of the meaning from the first slide since you couldn't see it, but I didn't ask you to write it. So you won't have to remember that. <clears throat> but if you're curious that it, it's in the back part of the church above the, 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 but that's the one that melted. It literally melted from the heat of that fire. And uh, wasn't that 2019? Yeah, um, <clears throat> and collapsed because uh, it was metal. And it was designed to be there by the original bishop, but never finished. And then a much, much later bishop in the 1840s or something that late uh, started working on it, raised money, and it was finished sometime around, you know, the late, no, the mid 1800s. So there is a tall taping spire. It just isn't visible from the front. Okay, let's walk around this. And, here, you know, the walls of, of um, stained glass, you get the idea, but you're going to see the effect from inside. Now, now that's what I consider... <laughs> One of the three or four most beautiful sites on earth, <laughs> especially at night, but I don't have any night slides of it. Um, <clears throat> these are the two towers. Here's your tall tapering spire right over the crossing, it's called, where the transepts, you'll have to write all this, but these are those 40 foot wide rose windows. And those, it, it, I think that's a more than a minor, whatever, call it a miracle, call it whatever, just, you know, good luck. 
they uh, they uh, by right with the heat, if it melted the metal of the spire, it, it could should at least have damaged these windows, and it didn't. The, the, thank heavens, the, st the uh, stained glass windows, the two large rose windows on either side of the transepts are intact, as are most of the stained glass windows. So somehow that's more than a little <laughs> common good luck. Here's your flag buttresses, see? It's like a forest of stone or, or a row of stone arms, right? And then they help support the weight of this massive ceiling and that, you know, spire. And of course, the walls themselves. And then they free up what's below them again to become walls of windows. Okay, and there are flying, but there are buttresses here, but it's hard to see. They help support the weight of the towers just in front of them. Okay, so let's go to another view for this from across the river, of course, the Seine. And here's another example why it's setting. The setting is right in the middle of one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And it hasn't been spoiled by any skyscrapers. You know, I'm disappointed the last time I went to London. If I went now, it'd be even more so. I love London. It's still a beautiful city. But there's so many American-like skyscrapers that are crowding the skyline. And that just in the last couple, three decades, that was happening. Even in the 90s, they weren't doing that. Um, this is in January, by the way. Global warming was already a topic. This is 1998. I was there um, when I was in graduate school. And I just remember I was already teaching here. Uh, finishing up a degree. And my friends from France, especially the ones that were savvy about environmental issues, were telling me, oh, we're going to have the next century, it's going to be a major problem, global warming. For instance, they hadn't had a single night below freezing by early January. Now that was more of a fluke because since then they have had, but we all know, I don't have to belabor what global warming's risks are. But anyway, you see more here of the closer view of how it sits in an island or on an island in the middle of the river. And it was built uh, for that purpose to be the dominant, it was for many years, the tallest structure in Paris, which is now the Eiffel Tower, of course. So let's finish up with a few interior views. This is the nave. Now remember, you're not allowed to bring tire pods or, or flash as if a flash would do any good in some uh, building this big, 140 foot tall nave. Uh, but I was able to get decent seats by uh, using the top of my <laughs> girlfriend's head <laughs> as a human tripod. That's what she said. Oh, you're using it. But at least otherwise it'd be so blurry you couldn't see it. This is with no, it's not digital though. <laughs> this, is, this is from the 90s. So a 35 millimeter camera. But I think this is a little bit more. You see the colors here? You just get a hint. You're going to see close ups of the actual stained glass themselves. I think that might even be next week now that I think about it. Well, let's see. That might be best to do after the break, but even where I'm pointing with the cursor, I think you can see the colors are rich, deep and saturated in a way similar to what's a chart on the colors there are even more uh, rich, I guess is the word or deeply saturated. Here's the altar. So there's your ambulatory would be walking around behind it and 140 foot tall ceiling. And then I'm gonna finish this section. We'll take our break with this view. Uh, this is the Chinese Madonna, I didn't name it. That's a name given by many Chinese Christians, including uh, one of my neighbors in my neighborhood who is from Taiwan and is, is, is in, a, well, at least he was the last time I checked with him a few years ago, uh, fairly observant, if you want to say, however, devout um, Catholic, I believe. In any case, <clears throat> I was there when a group like that from, from Taiwan, right? The island off the coast that's being harassed by the Chinese communist military. Um, they, have many of them adopted informally you know kind of just verbally said this woman it's mary of course mother of jesus has a slightly asian cast to her features but what's most amazing that's kind of itself a little unusual right how lifelike that baby looks compared to remember the icons with the miniature 30 year old man with a bad haircut remember that paint? we talked about how they couldn't paint small children very well in the middle ages this was done not long after the church was was open so it was done in the 1200s and that's still medieval that's not anywhere near renaissance plus it they think of it as freestanding but actually there is one little bit of support here from her back. So it's not quite freestanding, but by doing just like a buttress, there we go, just to the very upper part of her back, it appears to be that she's freestanding and no one knew how to do freestanding sculpture in the Middle Ages. The, the Greeks and Romans did, we covered that, but they lost that skill during the Middle Ages all over Europe. It wasn't rediscovered to the Renaissance. So this is 200 years before the Renaissance. It's a really remarkable. Anyway, I was there, some uh, bus tour of uh, 
the Taiwanese tourists uh, were obviously clearly religiously devout, went in and prayed and lit candles. If you know, you're some of you have been to Catholic churches for the soul of a departed loved one. And I uh, looked up and took pictures and were talking about it mostly in, I guess, Mandarin, but a few of them in English. And uh, the guide said some things in English too. So I know that they were saying, you know, here's the famous Chinese Madonna. It survived the fire intact. And again, the whole interior of the ceiling collapsed, or most of it. And in, you've seen pictures of the church after that fire, the interior of it. It's, it's amazing that some debris from the ceiling didn't hit it and destroy it. Okay, let's take our break. Okay, so make it, how about a 17 minute break to 8.20, all right? See you guys in about 17 minutes and we still have some more must knows and we'll still end early, okay. All right, all right. Um, we ended up with almost a 20 minute break as, as it was, but uh, we're still gonna end early, but I think we'll go past the end of, of the list of six weeks, uh, sweet. <laughs> week week 16 the reason being that'll give us a little more time maybe just one or two slides into next week because then that'll give us more time for the review uh okay so this is the next must know uh the slides of the stained glass windows are actually coming up but i don't know if we'll get that far tonight of the interior from inside Notre Dame. They're really nice and you don't have to take uh, notes on those slides when we get to them. But this one is on the list, Prophets and Ancestors of Christ. Prophets, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. Remember that kind of prophet, someone who's a holy person and I guess can tell the future, uh, not the other kind of prophet. And Ancestors, of Christ is the title. Chart. This is the cathedral we saw earlier tonight. Chart. C H A R T R E S. Eleven fifty five. Okay, so these fit the the uh, classic definition of Gothic door jam sculptures. Remember, we talked about door jam sculpture last week with the Romanesque slide of. Uh, Right, Saint, um, I have to recall his exact name, Prophet, sorry, I meant the Prophet Jeremiah is from the Old Testament of the Bible. Well, these are also from the Old Testament. By definition, if they're, if they're from the part of the Bible before Jesus, that by definition is the Old Testament. The New Testament starts with his life and goes forward, if you didn't already know that. So these are from the time of, uh, you know, the earlier text, which in essence is almost the same thing as the Jewish, right? Uh, Torah and uh, Talmud and the, the the part of the Bible that focuses on the early Jewish prophets and kings and queens. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at large, slightly larger than life carved figures of later they'd be called saints after after the New Testament, after Jesus' life. The Catholic Church would start you know, designating people as saints. So these are before that. So they're not saints. If you wrote that, it'd be wrong if it was on that. I'm not saying that there's, you know, not this slide is not so important that I absolutely won't cut it for the set list. We'll see next week when we do the review. Uh, but as always, you should have those notes for this uh, pending that reduction of the study list. Okay, so you can see they look well dressed yes they would be you know in essence from the rulers and or most important people in the early part of the bible the old testament uh and perhaps identifiable by some of the the, the congregation when they walk past them and they're along the you know edges of the framing you know just as you're walking into the church so they're called jam j-a-m-b statues and the other possible explanation besides figures from the Old Testament, prophets and, and, and uh, leaders from the Jewish right, period of the Bible, the other meaning many historians believe is that they also doubled, remember I said this earlier with Notre Dame slide, they might have a double or second identity as uh, portraits of earlier kings and queens of France. By the time this cathedral was built, the French royal family had been aroused. One of the oldest, it was, <laughs> it, it actually survived the, the revolution. Some of you know that. 
and they put another one of their descendants back on the throne after Napoleon, and then another one after that. <laughs> But they pretty much disappeared after the mid 1800s. So the French royal family lasted if it was the major interruption of that 25 years during the revolution and Napoleon. Let's see, let me do the math. 18, that was the 1850s when the last king of France was forced to abdicate. Uh, so we're looking at about uh, 1400 years, well over a thousand years. And so even by the time this church was done, they'd had over seven or about seven centuries. So you could just say it that way. This, this could be, uh, many stories believe, oh, a second meaning of these figures is that they're portraits of the earlier kings and queens of France from the previous seven centuries, because they had plenty to choose from. That's the point. One of the oldest dynasties, well, there wasn't a single dynasty, just, uh, you know, monarchies. There we go. One of the oldest monarchies in Europe, continuously uh, functioning monarchies was the one in France. So they could have easily have decided that that would give these people the, 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 the potential second um, identity of these figures, uh, a connection to the holiest figures, you know, at that time to, to most people were the ones in the Bible. So the, in other words, there's a political dimension of peace, a political propaganda is a phrase I like to use it. If this is a, a, an example of a dual meaning, which I think it does, it makes sense. And there's some evidence for that. Then another, uh, you know, meaning of their way to put the meaning is that this, this doubled as both religious imagery and uh, a piece of political propaganda for the ruling classes, particularly the royal families of France. Okay, it's pretty much the whole meaning, except for oh, one more thing about this style that marks them as typically Gothic statues on the church. They're stiff and formal. I mean, look at the way they're posed, completely different than the Romanesque style statues. Remember, we saw that last week, which would be when you see, you know, figures moving in motion, right? Dynamic poses, and not sitting or standing still. And of course their limbs were elongated here. They're all realistic in terms of the proportions. They're very accurate and realistic human proportions, but they're not doing anything. They're just standing there looking down at people as you walk underneath them. Um, I don't know about the rest of the people, but this, this kind of sculpture just doesn't do much. <laughs> there, you know, it's just static is the word. You can say stable. We'll get to the form elements in just a moment. Uh, and of course, that's, you know, a matter of taste maybe, but they certainly don't inspire any kind of strong emotional reaction, as was the intention and I believe the effect of Romanesque church sculpture those were intended to excite and you know inspire a passionate reaction among the viewers and here there it's more like you know you're being lectured to by a sober church hierarchy that wants you to just you know take what they say verbatim don't question it and just go in sit down quietly listen to the sermon and uh, do what we ask you to do <clears throat> If it isn't obvious, you could add this in the last fact, but to me, I would do a formal analysis that the royal family of France was almost always allied 100 or nearly, not 100%. There were some lower ranking priests who were willing to try and buck the, the church or the establishment, their own church, to help the poor in more obvious ways. But in general, the church, especially the hierarchy of the Catholic Church in France, I'm talking about during this period, all the way up to their revolution was very much aligned with the ruling classes. And that would make sense that these statues therefore had that dual meaning. Okay, plenty on these uh, folks here. So doing formal analysis. Sorry, I had to wet my throat here. Um, okay, what they are is stable. There isn't a dynamic feature in them unless you want to count their halos above their heads. I mean, even the way their heads are held, you know, with their neck and the sides of their faces, pretty much directly straight up and down, right down to their feet. They, they're almost entirely stable. Uh, I, I don't see really on the top of their heads, is, you know, because they're, you know, almost not quite flat, but you have, let's get up close to this. Well, this woman has, you know, <laughs> there's a little bit of a curve, this guy's, uh, crown maybe but you know that's it the, the halos behind them of course are not part of the figures 
And then there is the rhythm of the robes they're wearing and their hands and feet and faces, of course, all the, all the uh, parts of the human body. And then we have the line is all carved, of course. Very Now that's well done here. The similar texture on the robes, the hair, uh, you know, the, the uh, hands and feet, that's very well done with carved line everywhere. They're a cool gray color, even though the church stone, maybe you can tell depending on what kind of monitor you're looking at, that the stone, which is what's used for the columns here on the outside is the same as that yellow stone I would tell you is a warm color stone on chart on the facade. Whereas the statues are with a cool gray color. So we're only focusing on the statues, but you could mention the background of the columns that they're supported by or attached to, because they are obviously attached to these columns. Uh, that's warm, but everything around them is cool in this photo. Well, that other column here is. Um, okay, and then we have the largest mass. Well, they're all the same size. In fact, they're almost exactly the same height. That's an unusual thing. Why would they all be the exact same height? Usually women are shorter than men in any given era, era of history, but, but certainly in the Bible, there would be some evidence. Well, maybe not. So what you're looking at is just, again, kind of repetitious uh, imagery that would have been done all over France during the Middle Ages, all the way through, well, during the Gothic era, the late Middle Ages any Gothic church. There are a few exceptions, like the one at uh, Notre Dame. We saw that. That had a very lively uh, feeling to it, didn't it? The uh, Some people call it Chinese Madonna. Okay, so let's see. Then we have for space. Well, they're slightly taller than life, so they're uh, like six and a half. Let's say you know, somewhat a little under seven feet tall. And uh, then they are overlapping the columns behind them, and of course their clothing overlaps their bodies. Um, let's see, is there anything I'm forgetting? Oh, modeling in this case does have something to do with composition because the sun sets, I mean, sorry, as the sun shadows these figures, their, you know, details are becoming more, during certain hours, more visible. Uh, but, but it really isn't a technique of the sculptor. So it's natural shadows, natural modeling from the sun. Okay, and each figure is balanced, and, the, and then the grouping of those two on either side, if you divide the line down the middle and top to bottom. Okay, let's move on. This next one will illustrate, if it wasn't clear before, we're still going to end early tonight, uh, probably around 9.05 or so. Um, this one is the vaulted vaulted, V-A-U-L-T-E-D, -E right, ceiling of Amiens Cathedral. Amiens is the city in France. A-M-I-E-N-S, vaulted ceiling of Amiens Cathedral, France, 1288. So what we have here is one of the tallest naves, this is the meaning now, of any church in Europe. Now, there are taller naves in other parts of the world, but the original medieval cathedrals this is one of the tallest cathedral naves in Europe. It's about 160 feet tall. That'd be like a 16 story skyscraper can fit inside. So that's actually both part of the meaning. And of course it'll apply to the formal analysis when we get to that. All right, but then there's more to it than that. The reason I want to show you the view, if it's on the exam, I'm showing you three views. I, I'm doing it deliberately to, to give you context. So if you walk into church, the first thing you'll see, just, just as soon as you get past the entry door, entryways and into the you know front part of the nave, looking toward the altar, of course, and you look up and see this immensely tall soaring ceiling above you with the Gothic groin vaulting and the Gothic arches and clustered columns and things we've already seen. But then when you get to the back, and you're at the ambulatory now. Well, are you? Not really, because you're in the side aisle. But then it, it opens up into that curved walkway behind the altar. So it leads into the ambulatory. You don't have to write this yet. I'll tell you what to write when you get to the third slide. After One more after this. But look at the light flooding in here. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is that the, most of the windows never got stained glass put into them, which always darkens, of course, the interior of the space that they're uh, lining for obvious reasons. So most of the windows are not stained glass. There's a few that they finished. And the other is because of the height of the windows and the width of them. So when you go to this view, if it's on the exam, that's the view you'll have. 
look at the amount here. I think I did, or I read this somewhere, but I actually did a mental calculation. It's about 80% glass on the walls. It's remarkable. These are walls of glass with the minimal amount of stone work just basically to keep the window frames in place. You couldn't do that with any style of architecture before this. And here's your Gothic groin vaulting. It is not obvious the weight of the very tall, you know, uh, the ceiling itself, of course, the walls themselves, and then above that, the towers. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember, Amiens Cathedral, I think it's two towers. I haven't been to this town, um, but the weight of everything above that, right? Um, these these uh, gothic groin vaults is distributed down and out through these. And here's where the flying buttresses are attached, where each one of these columns are on the outside. Well, here you would see, because that's actually an aisle, you'd see where the, if you were standing outside, the flying buttresses, this arm, I've been talking about of stone, would attach to every, what, about 10 feet or so. And they're all the way around the back, just like you saw in my slides before the break of Notre Dame, of the exterior of Notre Dame. And then you have these walls of glass made possible. And you see how little of it is done with stained glass, really only in this one section here. So it makes the interior one of the lightest, most uh, you know, light feeling or in, you know, bright interiors of any Gothic church in Europe. And one of the tallest at about 160 feet. So let's do the formal analysis. The ceiling, it's one long narrow right space or nave, the right word is nave or aisle. Um, central aisle, which has a ceiling of about 160 feet. And then we have um, the carved line. Is it visible? Well, minimal, but there is some at the top of the windows, but most of it, it's visual line, most of it that we have visible in this photo. And that's, of course, around the edges of the stained glass windows and each of the arches. It's dynamic. The only thing stable, of course, would be the walls above the arches, uh, the ceilings that, and the columns, of course. But the ceiling itself, all of those vaults, you know, the, the Gothic groin vaulting, and of course the windows, the pointed arches, and the walls, and the interior are all dynamic. It's it's mostly, and then the curve line, shape of the back end of the church is all dynamic. So it's mostly dynamic. This is a um, a black and white photo, uh, so I can just tell you that the stone is a uh, well. Let's go back. We have it right here. It's a cool gray color. Yeah. Uh, kind of a light gray. Where it looks yellow, it often is the light from the sun. And of course, speaking of that, the modeling is just the shadows created from the sun. Uh, oh, there's painted line on that one stained glass window. That's why I forgot to mention it because there's so little of it. But most the rest of the lines are mostly visual except for a little bit of carving at the top of the middle row of windows. And let's see, uh, then we have the largest mass. Oh, definitely the ceiling. And then it would be the lower arches and then the windows, the upper row of windows, right? Um, and let's see, balance totally symmetrical, completely symmetrical, as most Gothic churches in France at least are, and most of Europe. Uh, left to right, and here it depends on if you don't count the windows as mass, but they are, but they're lighter than the weight of the wall. So if you want to say it's unbalanced or heavier toward the bottom, I wouldn't argue with that. And let's see, rhythm, so texture, the real uh, smooth texture of glass and the real rough texture of stone, of course. Um, and I think that's it. I mentioned space, texture, color, mass, modeling. Okay, we're going to go to, there they are, the stained glass windows. I do have them this week. I told you I'd show some. That's a 40 foot wide window. One of the two set into the, you have to write this now, just take a break from notes. This is um, a masterpiece, both of them are, and they were both created by local craftsmen living in the Paris area at that time, hired because of their skills, and of course, hopefully paid well, but in any case, they were the best available craftsmen. And this, including the windows, the windows, sometimes the windows aren't finished when the church opens, but then that can be a problem because of the weather. It can get pretty cold and damp and wet in Paris in the winter. So as far as I know, the windows were finished when the church opened in 1260. But when you get up close, you begin to notice, these are my own slides here. Uh, that's Mary and baby Jesus. That's much more naturalistic looking than the icon images of Mother Mary and baby Jesus that we saw a few weeks ago. And then these are different uh, 
the either saints or prophets from the Bible. I'm not sure which because it's hard to identify them. That's the close up of one of the rose windows. But now we're going to see that my favorite is the purple. Some people call it the purple window. Look at the colors in that. If you sit there during a certain time of the day when the sun's passing, the rays of the sun pass this window. And if you have the time, I did once. I had enough time. I had nothing else to do in the afternoon. I was going to meet this friend of mine after she got off of work, uh, you know, in the evening for dinner. So I just decided, I think it was a cold, rainy day or whatever. But then it suddenly the sun came out. And I just sat in the, uh, there are actually pews in this church. There are, but I don't think they're original. Anyway, so you could sit and relax. And I watched the sun pass, the rays of the sun pass from one, you know, end of this stained glass window and hit the floor. And the colors in front of me, right at my feet as I was sitting there, and then across my, you know, hands, and then over to the next row. It's a, it's a, a very powerful experience. It helps to have an enhancement of some kind, but they don't allow that in those churches. It's just a remarkable piece of uh, beautiful artwork. And these, these are the largest stained glass windows in Europe. Okay, and here's one that reminds me of Monty Python's early cartoons. I don't know if anyone ever saw the replays of those early Python shows before they start making movies. This looks like the unhappy peasant. Does he look like he's happy with his work? I don't think so. Well, why would he be? He's not being paid much. Help, help, I'm being repressed. <laughs> yeah, something, and he's got a scythe, so all he needs is a hammer on top of the scythe, and hey, he's a Marxist now, just being silly. But the colors are what I wanted to show you. These are, like I said, my own details. I don't even remember how I got I think I remember it, taking them with a the telephoto, yeah. So what you have here is the rich, deep colors I've been talking about that both Chart and Notre Dame are famous for. The reds and the blues are the most. But then you have this weird chicken-footed uh, lion. It's, what is that? It's something out of the Bible. I don't even remember. But the imagery is fascinating. There's so much to look at. Uh, and, and next week, we will see, time permitting, the, the city of Paris from the towers and the gargoyles face to face right at eye level. When you go up into the towers and step out on the parapet, it's safe, although a little scary. But don't go there when once an hour when the bells are about to ring, unless you've got something to protect your ears. I'll explain when I show you my slides of what it's like to be in the towers, uh, the bell towers of Notre Dame, and then look out over the city. We'll have time for that. And the gargoyles. Those will be also just for your own enjoyment. Okay, let's move on to the next must know. This is Reims Cathedral, two words, R-E-I-M-S. Reims is a city in France, of course. Reims Cathedral, the location in France. The date is 1428. So what we see here is a typical French Gothic cathedral with uh, twin towers. Now here they are the same height and width. Well, they're usually the same height anyway, but there's no playing around with the dimensions or the width of the proportions of them. They're, they're, they're identical. Uh, obviously it was being, you know, cleaned here with the scaffolding. Uh, but I did, this is a very old picture. You might be able to tell by some of the, the cars here on the street. It's, it's a slide, library slide. Okay, so what matters about this church, besides that it is a classic example of French Gothic, it's a period called flamboyant. And I believe that is one of the ne definitions that yes, is on the list of terms to know, I'm almost certain. So let me double check because <clears throat> yeah, I sometimes. It is. Yeah, it is, it is, it is. So, so here we go, flamboyant style. So this could be on the uh, section, you know, the uh, true Paul section where the, where the definitions come up on the final. So here we go, it's not a long definition. Uh, a, a late, style of French Gothic, or a style of late French, there we go, a style of late French Gothic architecture, comma. I used to put the dates in the definition, you don't, that's too much information. So it's a style of late Gothic architecture in France, comma, in which the decorations on the exterior have a flame-like quality, period, in which the decorations on the exterior have a flame-like quality. So flamboyant in French means flame-like. And some of you may know this. We talked about how many French words there are in, in English, 20% or so of our entire language is 
French words or French origins. Flamboyant is a French word and it means flame-like. So when you call someone flamboyant and then you turn to your friend and say, in other words, he's a flaming blank blank, <laughs> that's a French concept. <laughs> so we owe to the French that insult. If you don't know what I'm talking about anyway, you get some of you know what I mean. If someone acts outrageously flamboyant, they're often obnoxious and you don't want to be around them. And the French came up with using that term after, long after the style and the term was associated with Gothic churches to describe the behavior of certain people. Flamboyant can be a, a positive thing, but in France, it's usually a pejorative, an insult <laughs> for that reason. Um, I'm the only one that finds it kind of ironic that it has a bunch of flames on yeah. the house of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that a hidden meaning? Yeah, it does. Exactly. Which is what we're going to now talk about. Mm -hmm. So let's get up closer. The best, uh, well, I wish I had an even call, but see, look above the uh, three arched doorways. And then you see here, the bishop who designed this church, it's flamboyant Gothic style, late, uh, you know, Gothic style. And it was invented in France and it coined in France. And I don't think I've seen it in too many other, maybe in Belgium where they speak French, but mostly it's a French style. I invented in France. Okay, see here, these little bits of stone are supposed to look like flames licking up the sides of these uh, pointed, you know, was this an arch? That's the arch. So this decorative feature here above the arches. And then the same thing applies. Let's go back here to parts of the tower. Well, let's get it down. This is supposed to look like uh, flames around the top of the tower here the very peaks of each of these. These are called finials, by the way. Uh, and then it's also around here, but it's most obvious in this church right there, right above the three doors. Now, why would they do that? Well, it's made part of the meaning, of course, because this is was built during the era of plagues, M not just the Black Death. Everyone's heard of that, right? horrible way to die. One out of every three people in Europe died is what most historians uh, have estimated. There are actually records in, in France, it was that many, one third of the population. And we're, well, knock on wood here, at least nowhere near that with this horrible pandemic, as bad as it is. Uh, that that was just, and they didn't know what it was, what caused it, how to, they, the only thing they knew is rats made it worse. So they tried to get rid of rats in some cities, but you couldn't because of the way people, there was no garbage collections there. So it was an era of great uh, social suffering by the masses. That's how I like to put it for several reasons. One was the multiple plagues, you know, a series of plagues. That sounds like, you know, something out of the Bible. No, it, would, it went on for decades. They'd come and go, then they'd get over one and then 10 years later, another one. So multiple plagues that would, you know, uh, uh, continually uh, uh, appear uh, throughout Europe, but even worse in France, including the Black Death. That would make your life miserable enough right there. And then, of course, there was the poverty of the peasants. We saw an image of that guy cutting the wheat there uh, who had absolutely no rights, no freedom. Unless they ran away, then they might get away enough to relocate in a city. But most of them couldn't, couldn't do that. So there was the poverty and oppression of being a peasant. And it was getting worse because the wealthy were conducting wars against each other, the ruling classes, and they, they of course taxed everyone else to pay for those wars. And, and then, so there was war, in other words, and there was plague and there was political oppression. So when you put all that together, most people's lives were miserable. So why the flamey decoration or flame-like decorations on these churches? It was to symbolize the passion that so many of those people felt the only hope they had was to believe in a better life after this one. So if they went to these churches and they supposedly, according to the Catholic Church's teaching, followed carefully, very, very passionately and devoutly the teachings of Christianity through the Catholic Church, if they followed those rules and those teachings, supposedly they would be guaranteed a better life after this one. So it's a flame-like passion. That's what that symbolizes. The passion of the masses of people in France at that time, because that was one of the few hopes they had to cling to was their religion. And that is you know, evident in the decorative detailing of flame-like ornaments on these flamboyant uh, churches. Yeah, the 1400s was a really, well, they had the Hundred Years' War. I forgot to mention that. The one between France and England uh, that caused, you know, each battle was like thousands, 
and these was back when you know the populations were only in the low millions of an entire country right it's like 70 million now in britain and in france each about that and back then there was not even five or six million in each country so if you lost hundreds of thousands of people in one war and then you had a plague <laughs> and then a drought and locusts i mean you know at some point you know you might say is this worth it but yes you were supposed to believe you should be patient and just suffer all those you know, uh, calamities in this world, because if you're religiously devout, meaning, you know, very faithful and follow all the teachings of the Catholic Church, you will get a, a reward of a better life. And so your faith had become, it had to become very powerful, very strong to overcome all that suffering. And it, it was, there was all kinds of evidence that many peasants got very emotional in these churches, inside the churches during their services. Uh, and so the flame-like ornament is symbolic of the passion that people felt, the masses felt, for their religious beliefs. Okay, so that's the reason for it. But there's another whole passage. Anybody like champagne? <laughs> okay, this is the birthplace of champagne. The first champagne caves, which were accidental, you know that, it was an accidental discovery by monks, I think, uh, 400 or so years ago, more than that now, I think it was around 1600, are from below the streets of this city. This is the Champagne region of France. So the first champagne in the world was invented in this region, right below the streets, and indeed below the cathedral itself, are the oldest, or first, you could even just say, first champagne cave, because they had been there for a while before, and not had come up with the idea of champagne, but champagne was invented in the uh, wine caves, is a more accurate word, below the streets of this city of Reims, and including this square in front of the church and even right below the church. Oh, and one last fact about the meaning is the stained glass is almost all new because it was so badly damaged by bombing and fighting in World War II, the Germans didn't uh, retreat like they did from Paris, they, luckily <laughs> for the world. Some of you know this, Hitler wanted to blow the whole city of Paris up. You know, that's kind of sick malignant <laughs> cancer on the human race. He was, among many other things. He wanted to destroy the most beautiful city in the world, even though he loved and admired Paris. You know, he went there several, well, at least a couple of times when they captured France, the Nazis, and admired Napoleon, right? But because, you know, he was losing it to the Allies, he had orders for all the buildings, including Notre Dame and the Louvre, to be blown sky high with dynamite. And the general who commanded that, this is a sidebar obviously, who commanded the German forces in Paris refused to carry it out, told his men don't. He planted the dynamite and then he told them don't do it. Just leave leave the, you know, the, the plunger boxes they called them, right? That would have ignited the dynamite. Leave them alone and retreat. And he was executed, tortured to death when he got back to Germany by order of Hitler, of course, for not blowing up the city of Paris. But this was not due to German, you know, sabotage. Uh, the damage here was from probably mostly Allied bombing, but there was a lot of fighting in the streets of the city. So you get to summarize it by saying one last fact about the meaning is that the original stained glass windows, 90% of them, uh, literally, I've read that a couple of times, the vast majority of them were, you know, almost uh, all of them were, were, were blown out during the fighting in World War II and or Allied bombing. So they had to be replaced and they were replaced by modern windows, what were then modern in the 50s and 60s, you can see just after World War II, by Marc Chagall. I hope you know some of you who he is, was. He lived to be over hundred years old. He just died a few years ago. The greatest artist in France of that time because, uh, well, actually Matisse was still alive. They didn't ask him. But anyway, so this is uh, just say one of France's greatest painters who also did stained glass windows all around the world. He was Jewish, by the way, but he would do you know, synagogues, mosques, churches, uh, and he was very much in demand, but he, he designed the windows, the replacements, and they're all in that very you know, evocative style of his. I mean, it is not medieval or historically accurate, but it wasn't meant to be. So the windows were redone in, you know, after World War II by the, one of the most uh, prominent or just say famous artist in France, Marc with a C, Chagall, C-H-A-G-A-L-L, -L, if you want to spell his name right. I think at least some of you must have heard of him. He's in every textbook on 20th century art. So he was hired to do new designs. So they're quite striking in a way. I like them on one level, but on another, they're kind of jarring because they don't fit the period and the other features of the building. But that was a decision the local government here made and the Catholic Church, of course. All right, more than enough on the meaning. Let's do a formal analysis. 
it is uh, balanced left to right, totally. And of course, weighted or unbalanced toward the bottom. The rhythm is powerful here with the pointed arched doorways, uh, the rose window, the Gothic ar uh, arched windows all the way up the towers. The uh, statues again, here we have of, of uh, you know, figures from the Bible and possibly French kings and queens. And then we have finials, these are called, which end in supposedly flame-like shapes. Uh, all of that creates rhythm. And of course, those are all dynamic features, the round uh, rose window, the pointed arch doors and the doorways and all the other windows, the tops of the towers, but the overall outline of the building and the edges of, of course, the walls are stable, obviously. Um, then we have modeling here, which is just the time of day the sun creates natural shadows around the doorways. And remember, if this is on the exam, you could mention if, as part of the meaning, if you chose, that this is, again, an example of the uh, tri-portal concept or three doorways to all Catholic, large Catholic churches symbolizing the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? Okay, and then let's see, the color is actually uh, cool. It's hard to tell for sure in this picture, but of course it's being clean. It's a very light uh, gray color. The texture is a real rough texture of stone and real smooth texture of glass and then real rough texture of wood. The doors are usually wood, but you couldn't see them in some of the other slides that I showed you, but here you can. Uh, for space, the nave is about uh, surprisingly not, not as tall as it would have looked like from here. The two towers are about 220 feet tall, not quite as tall as Notre Dame. You could just say over 200 feet, but actually you don't want to say that's too loose. You say around 220 feet each, they're the same height. And then the nave is only about 110 feet inside. Uh, it's not as tall a nave as some of the others. That's not the actual roof of the building, otherwise that wouldn't fit, right? The, the nave ends right about here, I think it is. Okay, so that's enough for the real space. The largest mass, well, there isn't the largest mass. You can either say it's all one mass or the towers are the two largest if you break it down that way. And then of course the central section, the second largest. And the line is carved everywhere on the decorations, right? Because of the flame-like or flamboyant decorations around the doors and at the top of the towers and on the, the rose window. And uh, the other lines are visual. And then the modeling is, well, I already mentioned the shadows, it's mostly in between the, uh, the arches themselves here and up, up at the top of the towers. Okay, let's do at least one more and then see how time is going. Um, I think I might have cut this. I wanted to cut something to speed things along and not have you, you know, get too many slides that look too much alike that I understand makes it harder to. Yeah, okay. So this isn't from, I'm, I'm just gonna mention this in passing. You don't have to take any notes on this and we'll just spend a couple seconds or a few seconds here. This is a, a different uh, version of Gothic uh, sculpture. It's not jam sculpture, but it's at a cathedral in another part of France called Strasbourg. You may have heard of it. It's on the border with Germany. It's a beautiful city. Really great food and wine if you ever get there. But these have some movement, don't they? A little bit and there's emotion, unlike the ones we saw at Chart. Uh, that's probably, well, I don't know if it's Mary, it's hard to say, because you she would have a halo for West Snow. So these are, there's an angel, and then these are figures from the Old Testament, the Bible, but here they have some emotion and some movement. That's an exception to that rule of a stiff, lifeless, <laughs> you know, a static sculpture that most Gothic churches had. Uh, I am going to, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this one and get this out of the way. And then let's see what time it is. Okay, so this is on the, the list. Yeah, it is. Uh, Dormition of the Virgin at Strasbourg Cathedral. Dormition is D-O-R-M-I-T-I-O-N. Dormition of the Virgin. And that's always spelled with a capital V. Doesn't matter if you put a small v, well, that would just not be appropriate, but the spelling is what's important, B-I-R-G-I-N, of course, the Mission of the Virgin at Strasbourg Cathedral. This is the same cathedral I was just talking about. Strasbourg is uh, S-T-R-A-S-B-O-U-R-G, Strasbourg Cathedral is the full title. Once again, Dormition of the Virgin at Strasbourg Cathedral, France is the location. The date is 1230. 
Okay, so what does dormition mean? It means the death and rising up of the soul. It's not just the death of her, it would just say that. So it's the moment at which Mary is about to die and her soul is going to go to heaven. And that's a very popular theme for Gothic church sculpture. These are not jam statues. That should be obvious. Uh, this is within the arch. Now, I, I'm going to tell, there's probably no one here or in any of my classes in this last few semesters that would even have an interest in knowing. This is called a tympanum, the section. <laughs> I know, it sounds like part of a drum, doesn't it? Actually, very similar to the word for drums. It's just the way the arch is, you know, curved above the door, leaving space for sculpture. But you can just say the archway, the sculpture in the archway. It's a common theme, the death of Mary, and her uh, mo moment at which her soul is about to go to heaven. That's what the word dormition means. So what do we see here? Well, there's her son, Jesus, coming down from heaven to bring her back up. But wait a minute. He's carrying a, a, a statue of himself. Now, that's surprising to me and even a little bit odd, if not slightly amusing, but it doesn't end there. There are things in this sculpture that just, uh, uh, it's obvious that it isn't as skilled as say Renaissance sculpture would be later, just within a few more years, you'd get the early Italian Renaissance sculptors who wouldn't have made these kind of errors. Well, no, it's not an error. I'm not saying it's a mistake to have Jesus carrying a miniature of himself, but it's a little unusual. You don't usually see that in church sculpture. Mary is pretty much traditionally depicted, you know, looking up towards heaven, realizing that she's about to go there and join her son and he's come down to tell her what you're coming with me and or I'm going to take you with me back up to heaven. They pretty much is, all look the same too. You know, yeah, that? you're getting at one of the points I want to get. Yeah, yeah. Well, then there's this woman would be the other Mary, right? The, the only female disciple, Mary Magdalene. This is all part of the meaning, right? Don't ask me to spell Magdalene. Oh, okay, M-A-G-E-D-E-L-A-I-N-E. -E a long name just write it phonetically the other uh mary that is mentioned in the bible who was you know uh, very close to jesus and his only female disciple she's mourning the death of of, of uh the mother here of jesus and then there are as you pointed out again that's robert every one of these figures looks exactly alike it's like did they have the same model or only one model in that whole town for the this this sculptor to use but as if that's not weird enough their beards and everything this is my favorite silly detail that really shows a lack of skill of that era. It's not just this sculpture, but that period, the medieval era before the Renaissance came along and improved the skills of sculptors. This guy here, you know the play Hamlet, a last poor Yorick, where he picks up the skull of one of his friends from the grave and holds it in his hand and speaks to it. You know some of you want to talk about. It's pretty famous. This guy's holding the head in his hand of one of his friends. No, of course not. It's supposed to be yet another figure, but it's so poorly done. It looks like a detached head floating you know, behind the, uh, the people in the front. It's just so poorly done yeah, in terms of proportions and depth. Remember, we covered that fact from over a thousand years before with the early Christian art or late Roman art. It's the same concept. Here we are a whole millennium later, and they've only gotten slightly better. No, and actually, no, not even better. I don't see any uh, foreshortening here. We'll do a formal analysis and in a, a couple minutes. Uh, I think, yeah, we'll end then with this at about 10 after, and then I'll stick around to answer any questions you have. But I do want to mention that this is a classic example of how even late medieval sculpture, uh, or you can see sculptors, the actual artists, the sculptors, uh, had a uh, very less, much less um, skill, right, in their uh, depiction of... Uh, maybe, maybe he was trying to make a statement how Jesus is all of us. <laughs> that's a possibility. I don't know if that, probably the artist wouldn't have thought of that. But anyway, it's a reasonable, you know, guesstimate. But all we know is they couldn't depict depth and, and, and proportion very realistically all the way through the Middle Ages. And here's a pr proof of that. Um, okay, so then we're going to, uh, let's see, what other part of the meaning here? Well, just that it's in a cathedral in a, uh, a city in France. It's on the French border. So the artist could even have been German, it's possible. So let's do a formal analysis. I am gonna do one more because I suddenly looked at the list and I realized we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to cover. I'm not gonna do more cathedrals tonight. We've done enough of those, uh, but uh, I'm trying to decide if I should 
do well. Let's just cut one next week. Uh, I did say I want to end around 10 after. So we'll do the formal analysis here. Um, what style of church is it? Well, it's I've been there. I've seen this church. It's a Gothic church, but for some reason, this is a Romanesque style arch. So that's the last fact you might want to write about the meaning. The arch is clearly not Gothic. It's Romanesque. And it's probably because the church uh, was replacing an earlier, the Gothic church, it's there now, it's a cathedral, was replacing an earlier cathedral that was in Romanesque style. But this doesn't look like, it's the same period as the rest of the Gothic details. So I don't know why they would have just chosen to put one part of one detail, one section of the entryway uh, above the doors, because clearly these are Gothic arches here, these pointed arches. And uh, the main doors uh, were, I've actually been inside this cathedral. It's quite beautiful inside. And it has a, a unique kind of stone. I guess you could add that as part of the meaning and then we'll segue into the formal analysis. Uh, okay, and it's a, it's, it's a pink stone. It's a very unusual color. And if it looks pink to you, it's because that is the actual color of the stone. And it's an unusual, in fact, almost a, well, rare kind of stone that is only used on a few churches in Europe that I've seen anyway. Uh, there's one in England. We're going to see that next week. In fact, that'll be our first slide for next week. Salisbury Cathedral is really beautiful, and that's one I'm not going to cut from the study list. We'll get to that at the start of next week. Okay, so let's do our formal analysis. <clears throat> well, color, I've already mentioned. What you have here is basically warm colors, right? Except for this, and that's probably because of mineral you know, contaminants or pollution even in the air. But look below here at the tops of these columns. So it's mostly a warm pink color of stone. And then we have the rhythm of the exact same heads and faces and beards repeated over and over. And then of course the decorative uh, carving above their heads. That's all done with carved line. And then of course the rhythm of the human bodies in general, the ones where you can see most of the bodies of the four figures in front and Jesus arms, hands, legs, heads, and the robes, of course. And that's all done with carved line. And then we have for space, there's only one technique. There's no foreshortening here, just overlapping. Uh, Mary Magdalene overlaps the body of Ma the Virgin Mary. And of course, the clothing overlaps all of them. And then the four figures in the front overlap the ones in the back. But then they just all look like they're standing at exactly the same distance, you know, within an inch of each other from the dying Mary, and that would be, you know, obviously it's not realistic. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and then we have for stable versus dynamic. Well, it's mostly stable, except for these two figures on either end, because she's lying flat. Uh, Jesus is standing upright, and at least the closest mourners or other disciples to him are standing upright, but you could just say it's a mixture, because obviously Mag Mary Magdalene's curve is a curve to her back. These two figures do. And then the way the heads are arranged by definition or by you know placement, they almost have to be tilted to you know diagonal angles. So even though they would be standing upright, the artist couldn't figure fit them in you know any other way. So um, at this point, you'd say you could just say it's a mixture. Some details are dynamic, uh, but mostly it's stable on the back row of mourners uh, and on Jesus and then dynamic and Mary. The, the dying Mary, and then uh, stable, I'm sorry, dynamic on the three figures in the front, clearly, right, that we can see all of. The modeling creates the texture, well, the simulated texture is created. It's realistic and well done, as most medieval sculpture was able to do, with the robes, the hair, you know, and uh, the uh, hands, and, and you can't see anybody's feet, really. Yeah. So all the details done very realistically, the simulated textures. Uh, and uh, then there is, let's see, you can't see any other textures besides the real texture above them of this smooth stone. It's probably part of the fact that they chose this stone is that it has a smooth texture uh, just in the archway. <clears throat> the largest mass would be Mary if you could see all of her body or maybe the bed. So you decide. And then it would be the two mourners on either end, their disciples and Jesus. At either end of the bed, and then Mary Magdalene and Jesus about equal. So I'd say that's the three largest. The, the head, floating heads behind them are all about the same size. 
Okay, and then we have, uh, so in other words, the sun creates modeling, but the modeling is part of the composition. Um, there, for space, I already said there's only overlapping, and I don't think you can make the case that there's any foreshortening. I don't see any anywhere, and no diminishing size or any of the other realistic techniques for space. Okay, and uh, let's see, balance, yeah, that it is in the number of floating heads on either side of Jesus and the two mourners on either end and Mary Magna in the middle. So it is balanced left to right. And I would say top to bottom as well. Um, am I forgetting anything? Texture, modeling, rhythm. Uh, I think I've covered everything on this particular slide. Let's see. Um, I know I always think there's something I've forgotten. The largest mass. Well, yeah, I think we've covered it all. Okay, um, next week we will We'll go to, whoops, yeah, we'll go back to the late Gothic slides. I just double checking to see, yeah, right. Okay, so we will finish Gothic next week and it'll take the whole first half and we probably won't take an early break because there's a lot to cover, but I will not end the class. Well, I may still be able to end a few minutes early, but I don't want to rush through the review portion. It's so important for all of your sakes for you to know what to study and what is or isn't going to be possibly on the exam. Same way we did before the midterm. Um, okay, so uh, at this point, we'll just leave it with this comical image here and uh, stop to share. And then I'll take any questions anybody has uh, before we sign off for the evening. I think a couple people joined right after we started, but uh, anybody have any questions about, remember the extra credit options uh, do continue right up through final exams week, but any late papers that I haven't gotten, uh, I need to get them before final week starts and sooner, perhaps in the next few days. If, if I read, I'm not going to read again the list of people whom I haven't received both papers from at the start, just as a, you know, a kind of proactive way of getting everyone to, who's in that category to, to realize they might still need to <laughs> get that paper, or maybe if it's both, both papers into me as soon as possible. Okay, any questions anybody has about anything we covered tonight? Extra credit. Remember, two weeks and tonight is the exam, and next week we'll do the review. So you don't want to miss that or sign out at the break because that's when you'll get the information that'll help. And of course, that'll be posted, that review session, not the exam. The exam is going to be in real time, and then when it's done, you'll have till midnight to turn in, just like it was with the midterm. Same requirements. I will send you a detailed email with those, as well as the test itself the night before the test, so that you you know will have it printed out in time. Uh, certainly, you want to have it next to you when the class starts, and the test itself will start at six forty-five. The first slide will be on the screen. Okay. Any questions from anybody? Uh, at any point about anything uh, we've talked about or anything I didn't cover or extra credit options uh, or anything relating to this course. Anybody? Because this is your chance, right? I always give you guys a few seconds to search your brains and think if there's something you, you didn't think of before now that you might want to ask. Of course, I always check my email about five days a week, uh, my AOL and about four days a week with uh, Outlook. On weekends, I, I can't do both, I'm too busy. So I don't check Outlook much on weekends in case you are sending me something there, you want me to respond to it, it might take until Sunday night to respond, which means you might not see it till Monday morning. All right, one more time. Going, going, gone, as they say in auctions. Anybody have any questions at all? Because I appreciate your the comments and the participation were particularly, uh, I think, uh, appropriate and en enlivening. There we go, enlivening tonight. So I, I think that makes it more interesting for all of us. All right, I hope I'll see some more extra credit. That'd be my thought I'd leave you with uh, for everybody. Well, anybody who wants to take advantage of that option because um, it's such an easy way to build in a margin for safety in case something goes wrong. I'm, I'm definitely going to send some, but more for your own entertainment than for my grade. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, still, you'll still get the points. Yeah. I mean, depending on which category it is. I got I got a few things to send you. I, I'll try and get it out this week. Bro. Okay. Yeah. That, and then I always confirm when you get extra credit to me, as soon as I've seen it, I log it in and in my role book and then I send you confirmation. So you can count on getting confirmation. Uh, each time you send me extra credit about how many points you got. 
so you know I've, I've received it. Hopefully one or two of you will actually glance at my, <laughs> either one or both of my, uh, uh, you know, Amazon Kindle books, but that's an option you could ignore totally if you, if you don't have time for that. All right. Any other questions? Last time, last call. Okay, thank you. It was a nice session tonight. I think we got a lot done. We actually got a little bit ahead, so that'll reduce the, uh, well, it'll reduce the number of slides we have to cover next week, and it'll mean we'll have a slightly more time for the review. Okay, good night, everybody. Take care. <laughs> have a good week. <laughs>